Ladies and gentlemen, may I extend a warm welcome to every esteemed guest at the Central European Green Finance Conference, hosted by the Central Bank of Hungary, jointly with the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development and other international partners. Although this year held online due to a COVID-19 pandemic, it is the second time that we have had a public conference dedicated to green finance. 
This year, the presentations, discussions will be centered around the assessment of the adverse economic effects of the climate change, their quantification, renewable energy production, as well as investments in energy efficiency upon a green recovery from the COVID pandemic. I have the honor to invite Mr. Csaba Kondrács, Deputy Governor of the Central Bank of Hungary, to officially open the International Green Finance Conference and give his opening speech. Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the Central Bank of Hungary, let me warmly welcome our guests at our Central European Green Finance Conference, organized jointly with the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development under the aegis of the Central Bank Network for Greening the Financial System. We are truly honored, and it is an outstanding privilege that Mr. Janos Ader, President of Hungary, accepted our invitation to be the chief patron of the conference. His role certainly gives the necessary weight to the topics we will be discussed today. Let me also say thank everybody who accepted our invitation and we are honored to have representatives of many foreign central banks and supervisory authorities, several international organizations, executives of Hungarian and foreign market players, university professors, researchers, and other friends, all together, several hundred colleagues in the audience, even if we cannot see each other in this online environment. This year, we are together virtually as a direct consequence of the global pandemic, which had disastrous effects on the global economy and took a terrible toll on human well-being. It is still unclear how the economies of the world will be affected in the long term by the COVID-19 virus. However, we have an increasingly detailed knowledge of how the consequences of unmitigated climate change will affect our economies and more broadly ourselves as humans. And the outlook is grim. Countries and institutions will be affected differently but we know that all will be affected eventually. Some risks will materialize and other will not, but we know that in some combination risk will take shape eventually. We have had an extensive understanding for a long time of how human activities affects the Earth's climate and the natural environment. But today we also have powerful tools to mitigate the worst consequences. As a central bank and supervisory authority, the MMB has the primary mandate to achieve and maintain price and financial stability. To successfully realize these goals, it simply cannot ignore nature and the devastating effects of climate change and other environmental anomalies on the economy. As we all know, the Paris, Paris Agreement central aim is to strengthen the global response to the threat of climate change by keeping a global temperature rise this century well above two degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels and to pursue efforts to limit the increase even further to 1.5 degrees Celsius. The prerequisite to reaching this goal is to achieve carbon neutrality by mid-century. The Central Bank of Hungary takes an active role in fighting climate change and we encourage every stakeholder to step up their efforts because despite the uncertainties it remains within our power, but certainly in our responsibility to meet the challenge. First, every country and within every country, every company and institution have a primary responsibility to reach carbon neutrality in their own operations. But 
as the old saying goes, action speak louder than words. For that reason, and to lead by example, the board of the Central Bank of Hungary has made the decision for the institution to become carbon neutral already as of this year. To do so, we have set an ambitious goal to reduce our carbon emission by 30% in the next two years and by 80% within five years. In addition, the Central Bank of Hungary makes a commitment to offset the remaining emission to achieve net zero carbon footprint. A large scale offsetting project has been set in motion in cooperation with Worldwide Fund for Nature. We dedicate a presentation to this offsetting project today, also to provide inspiration to all our guests to jointly step up efforts for climate neutrality. Becoming a carbon neutral central bank is an important step, but only if it gives the right signal to markets as well. And that leads me to my second point. In order to achieve a sustainable economy, we need to make sure that financial institutions who give the lifeblood of the economy also make their own contribution. And they not only need to focus on reducing their own emissions, but also more broadly on limiting the emissions they finance, therefore shifting the whole economy in a less carbon intensive state. To facilitate that, I'm convinced that central banks must support the integration of climate related and environmental risk in the financial sector's own business decisions and need to accelerate the development of green finance to provide funding for environmentally sustainable economic activities and investments. Both of these aspects will be covered today to provide impetus for progress by market players. This conference is therefore aimed at highlighting the key challenges and finding solutions for this structural shift to a more sustainable economy. These requires broad and coordinated action by central banks, governments, financial institutions, and in fact, all stakeholders. Fortunately, our conference today brings together these stakeholders, both as speakers and audience, giving us hope that the discussion will result in some tangible steps and actions. Although the circumstances are dissimilar, Winston Churchill's words illuminate today's situation. I never worried about action, but only about inaction. With that, I thank you for your attention and wish all of you a fruitful discussion. Thank you very much. Mr. Kondrac, thank you for your welcoming remarks. Before we start the presentations of the conference, we have one more special message to give you. Please welcome an introductory video from Mr. Janos Ader, President of Hungary, who also acts as a chief patron of a conference. Three times the truth, as we say in Hungary, and another for good measure. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, looking at the topics of your conference starting now, four words came to my mind. Change of approach, tools, financing, cooperation. Four words, four quotes, four sets of questions. Change of approach. William Nordhaus, in his acceptance speech for the Nobel Prize in Economic Sciences, said, Climate change is a harmful, unintended side effect of economic growth, known in economics as an external effect or externality. If we do not take into account these 
externalities, we price them at zero, then there will be a price to be paid at the societal level. What is the value of clean air or the preserved fertility of soil or water preserved to be fit for agricultural industrial use or human consumption? How could we make economic and political decision makers realize that the costs of saving or polluting these three indispensable natural resources will have to be incorporated into future economic activities? Tools. A problem well stated is a problem half solved said Charles Kettering, the inventor of the electric starting motor. What kind of tools, new approaches, new economic calculations will we need to account for all environmental, competitiveness, welfare, sustainability and social factors impacting the stability of society at the same time? Financing. The 2006 Stern report states that the cost of actions to reduce the worst impacts of climate change would amount to 1% of global GDP each year, whereas ignoring the problem could result in economic damages amounting to up to 20% of global GDP. In an interview 10 years later, Nicholas Stern revised his cost estimates to 2% of global GDP. Do you think it is realistic for the European Commission to say that during the next decade we will need an extra 290 billion euros of investment every year only into the energy system and its related infrastructure in order to achieve climate neutrality. What are the forms of financing which best serve the desired objective? Cooperation. John Fitzgerald Kennedy said, those who begin solving problems when others are still talking about them will always be in the lead in life. What are the forms of cooperation at the EU, regional or domestic level, which can help economic recovery after the pandemic? What will this recovery entail? Reviving old structures or the use of new approaches in economic policy? And finally, three remarks in closing. It would be worth doing calculations about the economic and social damages caused by this pandemic and to compare these with the expected costs of the sustainability change. What will happen if pandemics that are similar or more severe will emerge more frequently than they did in the past decades? The topic of water is not on the agenda of this conference, despite the fact that without sustainable water management there cannot be a sustainable economic turnaround. And how much will all this cost? Shouldn't the polluter base principle be finally enforced more consequently? Moreover, shouldn't we begin to pay more attention to prevention? National bank experts have summarized in a bulky volume the fundamental questions of a sustainable economy of the future. And these are, what are the ecological consequences of economic growth? How and up to what level will global population increase? How can we keep up pace with technology? What geopolitical challenges lie ahead? What is the role of money in the digital age? 
The authors write the following in the preface to lead the readers through the aforementioned topics with open-minded, novel and sometimes provocative questions and related thoughts in these pivotal times. I wish you all similar courage for the conference. We thank Mr. President for his welcoming speech. I would like to invite Pavan Sukhdev, President of WWF International, to give his presentation. Pavan Sukhdev is a scientist by education, an international banker by training, and an environmental economist by passion. Years of work in sustainability and the invisible economics of nature led to his appointment as head, as head of the United Nations Green Economy Initiative. Greetings, and uh, it's a pleasure and an honor to be here with you at the Central European Green Finance Conference. Um, I want to talk about uh, the age we are in, which is the Holocene and uh, the impact that has been wreaked upon it by COVID-19. Put it in context and also leave you with some thoughts to consider for post-COVID renaissance, as I call it, towards a new green and inclusive economy of permanence. Um, First, a quick summary of where we are today, where as a result of COVID, it's actually a year of many crises across health, across climate, across jobs, and of course, GDP. Um, we have already last month in September lost a million people, now more than a million people to this pandemic. Uh, we have suffered massive hits in GDP, a technical recession in many countries, and uh, we have got yep many stories of uh, climate related and uh, of disaster, whether it is the wildfires in Australia earlier this year, or cyclones they die in Kenneth in Africa and other cyclones, droughts in East Africa, floods in South Asia, and uh, the dry corridor uh, problems in, in Central America. But perhaps the most painful of them, at least at, a, at an individual level as we feel, is the problems of unemployment. Well, the world has had 200 million unemployed for almost a decade now. There is a structural unemployment problem. And before COVID, the ILO estimate was 183 million. But after the first six months of the impacts of COVID, that estimate has increased to 660 million. And this is really a tragedy. We are heading towards a world in which, you know, potentially three quarters of a billion people or more would be unemployed. And that is devastating to their livelihoods, to their self-respect, and to our ability to be humans together. We need to act. But let us first understand in context. And before we, we take action, we need to understand where we are and why we are here. And also bear in mind that some of the problems of unemployment I mentioned are particularly acute with the youth. And youth unemployment is a powder keg for political instability and, and uncertainty. We are, my friends, as I said, still at the, at the edge, if you like, of the Holocene era, an era of 11,500 years since the last glacial period. And this epoch has basically given us stability. It has given us stable weather conditions and seasons. And those seasons have given rise to agriculture. And this is what has enabled humanity to progress to the point where we are in the age of technology and science and space travel. Uh, but unfortunately, the impacts of our activities, our economic activities, have been pushing planetary boundaries, not just in climate, but also in biodiversity. And the clash between humanity and nature, the fact that we have been unable to live in harmony with nature, has been one of the huge negative impacts. Now, this has been fairly evident. If you look at the last 20 years, just the last 20 years, which are really the blink of an eye in ecological time, then we have found that we are facing a series of four important 
uh, viruses. Um, it was SARS in 2003, H1N1 in 2009, MERS in 2013, and now COVID-19 in 2019-20. And this is the system. This is the, a stable, complex system which has negative feedback loops and positive feedback loops. One positive feedback loop is that as the temperature rises, vegetation accumulates more greenery, more leaves, and that actually helps to absorb carbon from the atmosphere. Trees are the world's oldest carbon capture technology, and carbon capture and storage is absolutely necessary today. But that negative feedback loop is actually good for us. It, it helps us through green productivity. There is a negative feedback loop, which is the various viruses that we are seeing, which result as a, as a result of a clash between humanity and destroying nature. All of these have arisen as a result of some unnecessary or unfortunate contact with the animal kingdom, which hosts millions of viruses. In fact, even HIV transmitted from apes into humans as a result of the bushmeat trade way back more than 50 years ago. We need to take some lessons away because a complex adaptive system such as the Holocene era, and by the way, we are still in the Holocene, according to the Global Commission on Stratigraphy. Um, that means that we are getting signals telling us that you know we should not be buffeting this system so much. The system is basically trying to protect itself, its own complex stability through these signals. We need to read these signals and become wiser, become more understanding of the need for living in harmony with nature. We are seeing some positive signs as well. For instance, sadly, as a result of the breakout in China way back in January, these are some, some visuals from space which tell you what was the extent of uh, nitrogen dioxide density before COVID struck and after COVID struck. And you can see that the air has cleared. Now, people are not aware of the size of air pollution. By the way, air pollution kills 7 million people every year. It's almost as high as the number of people killed by cigarette smoking and cancer every year. But out of those 7 million people who die of air pollution, uh, a large number are also in China. And in fact, some calculations show that the reduction in the deaths through air pollution as a result of COVID were actually much greater than the actual deaths from COVID in China. So there have been some, some uh, benefits as well, but I think the main benefit is that it has given humankind and us the ability to learn and the ability to, to, to adapt. And I think that adaptability, where we have all started working from home, rediscovering our family lives, rediscovering the importance of family, I think these are some of the learnings that we need to take away. And possibly the coronavirus is not all bad, so there is a silver lining. I think we also need to recognize that a crisis is not necessarily in isolation. In fact, the Chinese word for a crisis is Weiji, which is made of two characters, one for danger and the other for opportunity. So now I will talk to you a bit about the opportunities coming from this crisis. I would say that the way to capture opportunities is to invest rightly, but we need to invest rightly across the sustainable development goals. And we need to recognize that the 17 sustainable development goals have a structure behind it. There are four goals at the base, which are the ecological goals, goal number six, 13, 14, and 15. And investment to achieve those will ensure that we have stability in society, which enables the social goals to be better achieved, the goals relating to health and poverty and gender equity and so on. And once those social goals are achieved, equity is achieved, then only can we go towards the economic goals which achieve higher productivity. So there is the structure to these sustainable development goals. And unless we invest in the base, if you like, the ground floor or the layer, the lowest layer of this wedding cake of sorts, then I think we are being careless in the way that we invest. Secondly, I will say that it is really vital for us to invest across the capital classes, not merely invest in produced capital, but also invest in human capital, very important, and in natural capital. And if you look at the graph on the right hand side, which is from the United Nations report, the Inclusive Wealth Report from a couple of years ago, you will see that most of the countries which are in the developed world, the black dots, are actually where there is high human capital per capita as against high natural capital per capita. That's as a result of decades and decades, in fact, centuries of investments in human capital. Developing countries need to go that way as well. There is a false sense of security when we look at markets. 
Markets say, my friend, the economists, that they are leading indicators. Well, my friends, I call them misleading indicators. Please don't mis uh, uh, understand the role of markets. They are mainly trading the assets of the rich, whereas what your central bank and other central banks are dealing with is the world economy, especially the economies of developing countries. And those economies are mainly the jobs of the poor. So we still have a massive job. It doesn't matter what the markets are saying. We must understand also that in order to ensure that the poor are well protected, we must recognize the importance that nature plays in what I call the GDP of the poor. This means that the component of household incomes in the developing world, which come directly from nature in the form of either goods and services that they, they harvest from, from nature or indirectly from nature in the form of nutrients and fresh water that flow to the fields of poor farmers and that flow to the households through the various inputs to their to their cattle. These have to be protected as well. So we have a job to do in recognizing the role of nature as a huge component of the GDP of the poor. It's not 5, 10, 15 percent as some people make out. If you work it out as a fraction of the GDP of the poor, it is more like 50 percent, 75 percent and 90 percent across different countries that the team project of the United Nations has studied. I come therefore now to the, what should we do now? Yes, we should learn, we should learn humility. Yes, it's all very well to say that we are entering the Anthropocene, but there is a degree of hubris in saying that because in fact, we haven't yet, you know, absorbed the lessons that the stable Holocene system is transmitting to us. Let us look at what is causing problems and let us see therefore what can take proper investment to correct course and to move towards a green and equitable economy of permanence. I would say number one is the energy transition that is going on. Another equally important is the food systems transition. The third is to recognize that of the impacts that are driving us towards planetary boundaries, these are all coming from the nature of the economy that we have built. And two thirds of that economy is private sector. In fact, it is the corporation today that is the engine of the economy. In the US, by the way, it is 75% of GVA and jobs. We need to recognize that we need to change the way corporations measure and report performance. It's not just about profits for shareholders. It has to be benefits for stakeholders that we account for, and this is possible. And finally, financing for sustainability is, is absolutely critical, not merely changing finance, but financing change. Both sides have to be addressed. And last, but not the least by any means, is what I began with, which is that let us absorb in humility the lessons from the Holocene. Let us absorb the lessons from COVID and understand where we as humanity have gone wrong. How do we correct ourselves to respond better and live in harmony with nature? So firstly, on my five strategies, the energy strategy, there's good news here. Compared to the last decade, coal-fired power has become much more expensive than solar grid, even including storage. And these are opportunities that are available to us today. And yes, the politics may not always suit, and th this is certainly as true in the United States as elsewhere. But again, I think politics will tell. I think what we need is not just uh, financial capital, but also political capital. But I'm optimistic that seeing the success that is visible already, um, many economies and certainly uh, Central European economies will look to the opportunity that renewable energy represents. Grid solar projects are today coming through at something like two and a half cents per kilo kilowatt hour, as against 10 years ago, it used to be 35, 40 cents. There's a massive you know, decade of change that has gone through, which is delivering some amazing results. This is also being reflected in the size of investment that is happening in solar. Here's a graph that shows you renewable energy investment. You can see the rate at which solar PV has been increasing in investment. And I think this will continue. And this is a very good sign already that the, some of the financing uh, direction has already started to change. Another area which needs significant uh, resolution is our food system. Our food systems are broken. 800 million people go to bed hungry and other equal number are suffering from obesity. More than 2 billion people basically suffer from some form or the other of micronutrient defi deficiency. And according to the Global Nutrition Report in 2016, they had identified our diets, what we eat, as the number one burden of disease, and higher even the cost of human health, higher even than air pollution and cigarette smoking. So clearly, we are missing something out here. We are missing the reality that there are different forms of agriculture that are possible that can actually support the livelihoods of the 1.3 uh, billion people that are in, in smallholder farming. 
and there are ways of producing which do not force us to lose the opportunity to achieve goal number two on sustainable agriculture, goal number three on human health, and goal number one on poverty, goal number uh, five on gender equity, and last but not the least, the environmental goals, goal number six on fresh water, 13 on climate, and 15 on life on land. There are ways to produce, and this is possible. Two examples, this one is from, from Brazil, where the soya uh, group of, the soya producers teamed up effectively to create a moratorium first and then an agreement on how to go sustainable on soya production. And you can see that the annual deforestation as a result of soya has been declining, even though at the same time, the area and the soya by year has been increasing. So sustainable farming at scale is possible. And India has a remarkable example in its state of Andhra Pradesh, a state of 55 million people, where natural farming has scaled up to more than 650,000 people, 600,000, 50,000 farmers have begun the transition to natural farming, which means zero use of chemical pesticides and fertilizers. Their yields are higher across the staple crops, including uh, wheat and uh, in, including rice and groundnuts, and crash crops like chili and fruit and vegetables. All of them are showing higher yields at lower costs because the cost of inputs has gone down and the profits of the farm are improving. It's a remarkable example here because it also is based on the making use of women's self-help groups, and they have been the leaders out here. On the left-hand side, you see uh, a young lady farmer who is a master farmer. Uh, she was a landless laborer in India. On the right-hand side, you see a lady proudly showing off her field, which has not been affected by the cyclone, whereas the neighbor's field, which is unsustainable farming, has been affected by the cyclone. Third, I'll come to the whole issue of corporations as drivers. If we look at the business sectors, we will sign, find that the impacts of the corporation can be measured and they should be measured. And these are impacts in terms of not just greenhouse gas emissions, but pollution, as well as positive impacts in terms of human capital and so on. But if we look at the negative impacts, and if we look at the list which was worked out uh, by uh, True Cost and uh, for the, uh, uh, the, the United Nations some time back, you will find that the top impacts actually have a very close correlation to the planetary boundaries. The drivers of these impacts are the drivers of our inexorable march towards the planetary boundaries, the diagram on the right hand side. That's what we need to alert ourselves to. We are measuring only profits for shareholders. We need to start measuring impacts for stakeholders. And this can be done. Impact weighted accounts have already started to being produced. They are known as integrated profit and loss accounts in some cases. The age of impact transparency has begun and we as uh, business people, you as central bankers and the entire community, uh, the government community in, in Europe has a huge opportunity to move forward with a form of reporting of corporate performance, which accounts not merely for profits on shareholders, but also on human capital, natural capital, social capital impacts on stakeholders. This is already happening, but this is still in the realm of corporate sustainability leadership. My question is, will there be followership? And that's what we need. We don't just need leaders, we need followers. And last but not the least, let us look at sustainable financing. Today we are hesitant to finance sustainability. There's of course a degree of history behind here. There are cases which have come across. I am actually an ex-banker. I spent 25 years in banking and finance as someone mentioned uh, before I transitioned fully to my passion which is environmental economics. And, uh, and I found very often that some of the most excellent cases of bank financing, such as solar home systems, will not be invested in because it's new technology, whereas the same bank and the same lending banker will go ahead and lend to the man in the family for buying a motorcycle, as if there is less risk in riding a motor motorbike compared to uh, buying a home solar system, which will last 25 years and save the, the money for the household to be able to repay the loan. So there are some attitude changes that have to be addressed, but equally at a very large scale, we have to better recognize risk in banks' balance sheets. We have to recognize that today's externalities are tomorrow's risks and tomorrow's risks are day after tomorrow's costs. When we have unsustainable assets, especially those which generate greenhouse gases or, or air pollution and so on, those externalities could become the subject of regulations, which could then become risks to the company and costs to the shareholder and to the company. And we as bankers or as investors have to be cautious about that and recognize that there is negative alpha sitting inside our balance sheets and in our investment portfolios, which needs to be measured and managed. This can be done, and it has already been done by some leading investors and some leading bankers. Time has come for this whole system to scale. Integrated profit and loss, 
not just for the corporation, but even for the bankers and for, uh, for the investors. And last, but most importantly, you know, we are waking up. We are waking up to the climate, as, as a famous author wrote. But waking up does not mean growing up. We need to recognize that we are one global community. Building walls between countries, building barriers between societies, building divides and anger and, and uh, frustration between different religions. These are not the ways forward. We need to grow up as a community, recognize that it's not just about the individual tribe or indeed about the state or indeed about the country, but it's about us as humanity, part of a whole. We need to live together and work together. And if we do, so, if we do so, there is success going forward. We can actually put our energies, achieve these five transitions that I speak with you about, absorb the lessons from the Holocene, understand what the earth is telling us and proceed to get more prosperous and to live in harmony with nature. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Sardiv. Ladies and gentlemen, the first section of today's event will focus on risks stemming from the climate and environmental for the financial system. You can submit your questions via chat using the Q&A button, which you will find under the screen. Please note that this function is only available for those who are following the conference as a logged in user. In other words, this function does not work if you are watching the YouTube stream. The questions will be answered after the presentations as part of a roundtable discussion with all speakers. The topics will be addressed by Mattia Romani, Majun, and Joe Paisley. First, I would like to invite Mattia Romani to give his presentation. Mattia Romani is EBRD's Managing Director for Economics, Policy and Governance. Before joining the EBRD in 2014, he was Deputy Director General and Chief Economist of the Global Green Growth Institute, Senior Expert with McKinsey and & Company, and Lord Nicholas Stern's Deputy on the UN Secretary General's High-Level Advisory Group on Climate Finance. Yes, thank you very much and good morning, uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you very much for uh, inviting me uh, to uh, the Central European Green Finance uh, Conference. It's an, uh, it's an honor to be, uh, to be here on behalf of one of the sponsors of the conference, the European Bank for Reconstruction and uh, Development. It's incredibly difficult to uh, speak after uh, my friend Pavan spoke. It, it was a fantastic introduction to uh, to this topic, and I really thank him for his uh, for his words and very interesting uh, insights into this space. Now, what I want to talk to you about um, uh, are uh, a little bit of uh, what EBRD is doing uh, uh, in this uh, uh, in this area and on this topic, on uh, particular the green economy, and the transition to uh, the green green economy. As you know. Um, uh, I will cover a few topics, but you will be very familiar with the introductory topic of my of my presentation, which is what the EBRD is. EBRD is ultimately a transition bank. So the transition to the green economy is very much part of the EBRD's DNA. So I can go quickly through the first slides as I'm talking to an audience that will know the institution well, but as you know, we are an international financial institution and we are supporting the development of sustainable, well-functioning marketing economies in Eastern Europe, Central Europe, Central Asia, 
uh, North Africa and the near Middle East. Um, our focus is very much on creating positive impact on people's lives through markets. So uh, our objective is to have an impact ultimately on, on, on people's lives. And we believe very strongly in taking a multilateral approach on this. We believe that economic integration and uh, the power of the private sector can be absolutely essential in fighting common challenges. And I'll say a few more words on why we believe that in particular the challenge of a transition to a low carbon economy is in a way can be tackled effectively through markets and economic uh, integration. We're strong believers of combining private investments with strong policy uh, reforms. Um, you may wonder why we believe that markets can help save the planet. We don't think just any markets can help save the planet uh, from the risks of climate change, but we believe that markets that have certain characteristics, certain qualities, we call them the six transition qualities, can be um, sustainable, well-functioning market economies. Yes, we want economies to be competitive, we want them to be integrated, we want them to be resilient, particularly in moments of crisis like the one we are going through, but we also want them to be well governed, have institutions that work for people. We want them to be inclusive, we don't want them to leave people behind, and we don't want, um, we don't want markets to continue to ignore the costs uh, uh, of externalities, in particular environmental externalities, we want markets to be green. So we believe that markets that have the six characteristics um, can be powerful forces for change. So I said I would go quickly through these areas, I'm sure people are familiar with it, but maybe people will want to know a little bit more of our thinking around the green economy transition. So after uh, Pavan's presentation, I don't need to tell you what this chart is about, you know it very well. It's a chart that tells us uh, um, what are the warming projections for the next uh, 80 years or so under different scenarios of emissions. So on the left hand side, you have global greenhouse emissions. On the right hand side, you have, uh, sorry, on the, um, uh, on the ver vertical axis, you have green uh, global uh, uh, GAG emissions. On the horizontal axis, you've got time. So you can see that in a world where we uh, continue to behave as we behave today, and uh, this is the gray area, we would greatly miss uh, the two degrees line, which is on that chart that tells us what scientists uh, uh, believe is a safe level of uh, global warming that would reduce the risks of substantial damages due to climate change. So we're very far under current policies to achieve that, that's the blue line, um, and uh, uh, even with the current level of pledges the governments have made, we still are far away, and that's the light blue uh, wedge in that chart, very far away from uh, reaching that level of emissions that would allow us to control the risks of climate change according to um, scientists' evidence. So um, uh, we have to accelerate. We got to go much, much faster uh, if you want to achieve uh, this reduction in risks. So uh, let me tell you a little bit how we think about this. So uh, we believe that there's a number of economic actions that can be taken in order to uh, in order to achieve that, re that level of emissions that I indicated on that chart as being safe. You may not be able to see the details of this of this uh, uh, chart, but don't worry. I can tell you in a nutshell what this says. What this chart shows is a baseline of emission that's a grain lie at the great the great bar you see on the left hand side of that chart of that chart that tells you what is the current uh, level of gigatons of uh, co2 equivalent emissions and as you go towards the right hand side of that chart you see what are the different uh, levers very much in line with the five uh, uh, five uh, uh, challenges that um that uh, Pavel uh, showed us in the previous in the previous presentation what are the different levers that can lead us to a potential level of emissions in in by 2030 which is in line with achieving uh, that wedge uh, of emissions that I showed in the first chart that is a safe two degrees compatible sort of level of emissions and as you can see each of those columns tells you how many uh, so how much uh, each lever can achieve in terms of emission reductions um, so you see there things like cities, 
what we can do by making our cities more efficient. It talks about land use and the incredible achievements which are possible by managing our land better as a natural, a natural uh, capturer of emissions. This is similar to uh, something we saw in the previous presentation about the role that trees can have. Land use can have a very important uh, role to play. And the third wedge, the yellow one, is around energy and the transformation of the energy system and so on until you get to a potential level of emissions, which is in 10 years time in line with the objectives. And all of those wedges are created with existing technology. This is not things that are based on new inventions. This is entirely based on existing technology. So the key message from the slide is we can, in the next 10 years, reduce emissions by the level that we need to with existing technologies. You may ask yourself, yes, you can do that, but they, that will cost a fortune. And that's what the next chart tells us. The next chart tells us that, in fact, the infra infrastructure capital spending that is needed to be on this low carbon scenario does not cost significantly more than staying on a business as usual. And again, this chart starts from a base case, which tells you over the next 10 or 15 years, what kind of infrastructure investment on a business as usual we would see in the world. And it estimates that we need approximately 89, $90 trillion of investments, even on a business as usual uh, sort of scenario that would not achieve the two degrees, uh, the two degrees uh, sort of limits of emission that we looked at. And then it tells us, well, what would we need to do more or differently in order to achieve the two degree scenarios over the next 10 or 15 years? Again, with existing technology. So we would need, and I'm going from the left to the right hand side of the chart, we would need additional spending for energy efficiency. Um, that's a plus. We would need additional spending for low carbon technologies. That's a plus. But we would have substantial reductions in spending thanks to the lesser capex needs on fossil fuel investments, which are in that red baseline line. We would also have substantial reduction in needs in terms of saving in electricity transmission and distribution, thanks to a more efficient system to distribute our energy. And finally, we would have a substantial reduction in uh, capex thanks to, and opex in fact, thanks to better cities where we can organize ourselves better and spend less energy for our work. And what that tells you at the end is that the kind of investments in infrastructure you would need to achieve that low carbon scenario is actually in the same ballpark, is at $93 trillion. So the lesson from this slide is that actually in terms of cost, we don't need to spend much more to achieve that two degrees level of emissions, compatible level of emission. And in fact, I think this chart was made before our COVID, the current COVID-19 crisis. I believe that those numbers would look different now because we've discovered we can change more quickly, we can adapt more quickly, we can do things differently and more efficiently without that much need for CAPEX. So, I believe that, uh, uh, if anything, these numbers are very conservative. So, so far, we've seen that over the next 10 years, the needs, the, 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 the uh, transition to a low carbon economy needs to ac accelerate drastically in order for us to reduce risks of exceeding two degrees. We also saw that this can be done with existing technologies. And what we saw in this last chart is that um, we can actually do it at a similar cost, similar ballpark cost that we would face anyway uh, in a business as usual uh, scenario. So is it all good news? Are we done? Well, not quite. Uh, there are some dark clouds on the horizon. So let me show you two of these dark clouds in this chart. So this chart tells us that significant obstacles still remain. So on the left hand, chart, on the left -hand side of this chart, you've got something that tells you the size of fossil fuel consumption subsidies in emerging and developing countries. So this is uh, an estimate of how much money every year governments spend to subsidize fossil fuel consumption. And it tells it an absolute amount, that's those bars. 
and it tells you as a percentage of GDP. The top countries on that chart, Iran, Saudi Arabia, Russia, they spend um, in Iran over $80 billion a year in fossil fuel subsidies, in Saudi Arabia over $60 billion a year, in Russia over $40 billion a year spent subsidizing fossil fuels. But this is not just the story of large energy producers that subsidize their energy. On those charts, we have countries like China spending almost $30 billion a year subsidizing fossil fuels. Indonesia, same levels. And these are countries that spend significant, in the case of Indonesia, that's 3% of the Indonesian GDP spent every year in subsidizing fossil fuels. Those numbers are, in my view, astonishing. And it's one of the big, big obstacles to taking strong action on climate. And this is one of the obstacles. I took another chart on the right, right hand side to show another obstacle. And that is a chart that shows you the number of coal fire power plants under construction and planned versus the amount of coal that we believe can be burned for energy in order to stay within that two degrees um, limit to emissions. So the reddish line tells you what the limit should be in order to uh, achieve those two degrees. The blue, dark blue line is the actual number under construction today. And the gray line is the number of coal fire power plants which are planned to be constructed over the next decade. And what you can see from that chart is that already the number of plants which are being coal fire power plants which are being built, which are under construction today, exceed the limits we need to we need to meet in several countries. And what it tells you is that the number of plants which are planned greatly exceeds what we, we, the level we believe is compatible with the two degrees uh, scenario. So um, it's not all good news. Uh, there are still some substantial obstacles. Just to give, put things into perspective, because some of you may wonder, yes, but you know, fossil fuels are being uh, subsidized, but renewables are being subsidized uh, as well. Well, the numbers are really dramatically different. Uh, and not only they're different in size, uh, this chart shows you that every year, uh, well, we took a 2016 year comparison. In 2016, to $260 billion were used to subsidize fossil fuels and nuclear. While in the same year, about $140 billion were used to subsidize renewable energy. So not only the number is drastically different, but the number uh, has a very different significance for economists, like many of the people who are uh, uh, listening to this, uh, uh, to this conference and participate in this conference. Now, the subsidies around uh, renewables are subsidies that need to capture uh, the CO2 externality that the renewables manage to take out of the system. In order to make them compatible to other energy sources, we need to put some subsidies to capture the fact that this particular energy sources allow us to take out, to replace uh, a fossil fuel um, energy source, which would otherwise have strong externalities. Not only the number is different, but the, sig the, 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 the meaning of that number, of course, and the way in which that number plays into the economy is, is very, uh, very different. Okay, so let me now move to the second part of what I want to tell you, which is around uh, the risks to the financial system. So um, we talked about this before, we, we heard of some of this before, but uh, I believe that the numbers associated with the risks uh, that climate change could pose to the financial system could be commensurate or even bigger than the 2008 financial crisis. And this is based on the estimates of losses due to, um, due to the transition uh, risks for, uh, of climate change. And this are estimated at being between one to four trillion dollars, considering the energy sector uh, alone. When you look at the economy more broadly, the estimates are that over 20 trillion uh, of the economy could be at risk because of climate. And these are risks across the six dimension that you see on the slides and the estimates are on the basis of uh, a study by the London School of Economics. So I'm running a little bit out of time. So I'm gonna go quickly through, uh, uh, through the next point, which is my third uh, 
uh, third point that I want to make uh, beyond beyond the risks on uh, on uh, the financial system, and this is about managing the risks of stranded assets and communities. Some estimates suggest, and this is a chart that we produced at the EBRD that looks at the exposure of different regions in Europe to the potential loss in value of assets associated with fossil fuels as we transition to low carbon economy. And in short, what this chart tells you is that about 2.5 trillion of assets, around 3% of the world GDP is at risk and that substantial jobs are at risk. At risk. This chart is about jobs. Substantial jobs are at risk. Uh, and what we need to do is to try to ensure as we move quickly, as we accelerate so the transition to a low carbon economy, that such risks are taken into account, the risks to jobs, communities, and people. And this is very much something that at TBRD, we're doing very strongly. Uh, and we're thinking about how we can repurpose assets, reskill, uh, workforce, make regions which depend on fossil fuels more attractive for alternative investments. And I just wanted to use the opportunity to tell you that last week, the ABRD signed a, a deal um, that indeed is a, exactly on this uh, on this topic in, in Greece, in a region which is completely dependent on fossil fuels, where we funded what will be the largest power plant and uh, solar power plant in, in Greece and will employ uh, several people in the, in the in the in that process. So um, just a final word to say that at EBRD we continue to be absolutely uh, committed to the uh, transition to a green um, uh, to the green economy transition. And I can uh, tell you that just last week our board of governors has approved our new strategy, which includes a 50% target of all our investments going forward been dedicated to the green economy transition. So the EBRD is very much, uh, very much uh, focused on this. And we've already invested close to 20 uh, billion euros uh, in supporting some of the work that I described is needed uh, to achieve uh, that safe level of emissions in the world uh, going forward. So let me stop here and thank you uh, all very much for the attention. Please welcome Majun and let's hear his speech. Dr. Majun is currently Director of Center for Finance and Development at Tsinghua University, Chairman of China Green Finance Committee and a member of the Monetary Policy Committee of the PBOC. He also chaired the G20 Green Finance Study Group, Supervision Workstream of the NGFS and Hong Kong Green Finance Association. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Hear you. Great. Thank you very much for inviting me to join this very important conference on green finance. Um, let me um, talk about two subjects. One is uh, the uh, green finance practice in China. And secondly, uh, in my capacity of the uh, chairman for supervision workstream of the NGFS, I'd like to talk about environmental and climate risk analysis, uh, which uh, was a major task of the NGFS over the past year. Um, starting with the China uh, practice, uh, I would say that uh, over the past four or five years, China has established a basic framework of green financial system and within that framework, we have at least five pillars. The first pillar is what we call the taxonomy, because the taxonomy is a basis for defining green activities and for defining um, what green finance should support. So that's a very important basis for green financial activities and making sure that uh, green wash is prevented. So over the past years, China has established the three sets of green taxonomies. One is for green lending, one is for green bonds, and one is for green projects. And these taxonomies have evolved over time. The first taxonomy which we introduced was for green loans. It was a very simple one, one pager, 12 lines. 
And uh, in 2015, when we introduced the second taxonomy that was for green bonds, it was a 10 page document with 31 categories. And uh, the latest taxonomy, which is called green project taxonomy, was as long as 60 pages and involving 211 categories. This is important because uh, we need to make sure that the banks and other investors can use these taxonomies with enough clarity so that they don't confuse themselves. And uh, uh, with enough clarity and uh, the uh, detailed technical explanations of these categories, the uh, practitioners in the banking sector and institutional investment organizations will be able to identify green versus non-green projects more easily. And uh, some of the IT companies have began to use technology to translate these taxonomy into verification process automatically for banks. For example, in Huzhou Bank, which is a, a very uh, a good green bank in China, they are able to label green loans automatically uh, with a machine uh, simply because you install these uh, AI uh, technology matching green projects information directly with the taxonomy published by regulators. The second pillar is what I call um, disclosure. Disclosure is very important for green finance because all green finance projects will need to deliver environmental or climate benefits. For example, they need to reduce carbon, they need to reduce SO2, reduce NOx, reduce COD, reduce energy consumption, and reduce water usage. And exactly how much the projects have reduced such emissions or consumption of raw materials or energy, you need to quantify them and you need to tell the market. And this is what we call the disclosure requirement. Initially, we had uh, some voluntary uh, disclosure requirements. And uh, over time, we gradually moved towards semi-compulsory, uh, which is uh, if you disclose, it's OK. If not disclose, then you have to explain. And uh, over time, we are moving towards compulsory disclosure requirement for environmental information. By end of this year, the Chinese regulators, including securities regulators and the environmental ministry, will jointly release a mandatory requirement for all listed companies and all bond issuers to disclose environmental and climate information on a mandatory basis. By doing so, we can uh, substantially enhance the quality of disclosure and making sure that the financial markets and financial institutions are able to access such information for assessing the greenness of the uh, projects. The third pillar of our green financial system is what we call the incentives. Um, Sometimes incentives is important because the green projects are not profitable enough yet. Uh, maybe over time, three, five years later, these projects are going to be profitable because of improvement of technology and the gaining of economy of scale, but not now. And that's why we have to tentatively provide some incentives, either through the central bank or through the fiscal authority to make sure that these projects are making enough money to crowding private sector. And that's why in 2017, the central bank in China introduced the, the green relanding facility, which is a facility through which commercial banks can borrow cheap money from the central bank and reland to green projects. And at the local government level, we have lots of local governments introducing their own incentives, such as interest subsidies for green projects, for green bonds, and also guarantees for such green projects. Uh, one of the provinces in China is called Jiangsu province. They provide a subsidy to cover 30% of the interest payment for green bond issuance, which is a more aggressive one than many other regions. And uh, other places such as Huzhou, they offered anywhere between 6 to uh, 12 percentage uh, subsidy for interest payments for green loans, which means that uh, if the uh, original interest rate is 5 percent, multiplied by 12 percent, it's 60 basis points that's paid by the government. Um, so these are the instruments which we have used to enhance the uh, return of the project owners and thereby uh, crowding private sector money. The fourth pillar is uh, uh, what I call the uh, products and tools. Um, because green finance uh, uh, needs to meet the demand of many, many different kinds of projects. Some project owners want short-term money. Some project owners want long-term money. Some of them uh, require maybe 
money that can tolerate risks and others probably don't need money, but they need the insurance products to protect themselves against a certain risks. That's why we need a system of green financial products, including green loans, green bonds, um, private equity money, and the green insurance products. And over the past few years, we have established a system. Now, in terms of outstanding uh, amount, we have 11 trillion RMB worth of green loans. And over the past four years, we have issued more than 1.1 trillion RMB worth of green bonds. And uh, we have established 700 green funds, including the latest one, uh, which is the largest green fund probably in the world, uh, amounting to 13 billion US dollar uh, to be uh, allocated only to green projects for equity investments. And the tools also very important because uh, uh, green finance require a lot of environmental risk analysis. Uh, this is one subject uh, which in China we have begun to explore, but also globally, as I will explain later, uh, promoted by the NGFS and now a uh, lot of other agencies. And the final pillar is what we call regional pilot program because China is very large. Different provinces have different conditions, um, different uh, natural endowments and uh, uh, different uh, pillar industries. That's why they need to have a different approach uh, to uh, support their green economy. Uh, that's why in China we have set up uh, uh, nine um, regional pilot program for green finance and many of them have developed or invented some very innovative approach to uh, uh, green finance. For example, in one pilot uh, city, they launched a e-platform for matching green finance with green projects. And uh, uh, they gathered all the demand from small medium companies for green finance uh, uh, requests and they gathered 30 something banks, green products and they put them together on the same e-platform and allow the project owners to search for money uh, from the platform. I was hearing from uh, the uh, regional pilot program owner. Uh, he was telling me that uh, uh, one of the farmer uh, who was looking for green money to support uh, green agriculture projects was able to get a green loan uh, within nine minutes on the uh, platform. Uh, that's how we can substantially reduce the search cost of green finance for green projects. Now, let me switch quickly to uh, the NGFS work on environmental risk analysis. In the past year, the work stream which I chaired, which is called supervision work stream, has worked on two documents. One is called the environmental risk analysis overview, uh, which provides a non-technical overview of environmental climate risk analysis methodologies. And the second document which is called environmental risk analysis methodologies or case studies of uh, environmental risk, uh, risk analysis methodologies um, provides a collection of models and methodologies written by more than 30 organizations globally, including banks, asset managers, and insurance companies. This is uh, what I think uh, to date the most comprehensive collection of ERA methodology uh, for the financial community. The second document is as long as 600 pages. I strongly encourage all participants who are interested in measuring the financial risks arising from environmental and uh, climate exposure to look into these uh, uh, methodologies and try to apply such methodologies. Let me just give you one example of how such methodology can help uh, in transforming an organization. Um, one uh, analysis contained in the publication shows that uh, if you lend to a coal-fired power um, company, the current potential default rate is probably 3%. And within 10 years, the default probability will go up to more than 20%. And this is a methodology called climate transition um, model, uh, which shows that uh, the climate exposure, um, which is coming out of the coal-related company uh, to a bank can substantially increase its credit risk and therefore, by revealing the credit risk to the bank, the banks will have to take measures to uh, either hedge against such risk um, or simply by offloading uh, such exposure. And uh, by doing such analysis, I strongly believe that the many in, uh, in institution investors and banks will be able to shift their portfolio more quickly towards green and low carbon assets and uh, um, also uh, may potentially uh, guard themselves against uh, financial risks. Let me stop here and back to you, Chair.
Is that John? I would like to ask Joe Paisley to give her presentation. Joe Paisley is co-president of the GARP Risk Institute, the fourth leadership arm of the Global Association of Risk Professionals. Set up in early 2018, the Institute works across all risk disciplines, with Joe's focus to date on climate risk management and scenario analysis, stress testing and operational resilience. Her career began at the Bank of England, where she worked in a variety of roles across macroeconomics, statistics, supervision and risk. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to assume that you can hear me because everybody else is, is fine so far. Uh, absolute pleasure to be here today and an honour to follow Marjun and many congratulations on the publication of the, particularly the occasional paper uh, through the NGFS, which is an in incredible uh, comprehensive view on environmental risk analysis. Today, I'm going to be talking about how firms, are, financial firms, are managing the risks from climate change. And so I thought I would start by just briefly sort of talking about the kind of risks that arise from climate change uh, uh, before going on to looking at how they're actually managing them. So the first thing, and it's it's a fairly obvious point, but uh, sometimes I find that people don't always kind of go back to basics on this, um, is that there are two perspectives on climate risk. There's our impact on the climate and climate's impact on us. Um, and we need to think about which perspective we're thinking about when we're uh, trying to work out which methodologies uh, and, and data and tools we need to be using. So the first perspective, how we are impacting the climate. Now, this might be through emissions from transport, heating, deforestation, food production. That second perspective of how the climate is changing is, is impacting on us is typified here with the train uh, trying to get through the water. That's a, a manifestation of physical risk. But of course, we may be affected by all of the new rules and regulations and, and various transition risks as well. To add more complexity, these two perspectives are interrelated over the longer term. The more we impact the climate, the more it will change and impact on us. Um, and of course, the firms who emit are not necessarily the ones that get impacted. There are free rider issues here as well, which makes it all the more complicated. Um, because they have relatively low greenhouse gas emissions, uh, the main financial risks for many financial institutions, such as banks, is from the impact of transition and physical risks on their counterparties, for example, corporates and households. However, uh, financial institutions do also need to, to, to think about how their operations affect the climate. But the real uh, impact, the real transition will come through the real economy. So we really need to think about how financial institutions, counterparties will be affected. So corporates need to be assessing their own risk from both perspectives. Corporates need to assess how they affect the climate because emissions could not only result in reputational and liability risk, they're also a proxy uh, for their exposure to transition risk. In other words, companies and industries with high greenhouse gas emissions or a high impact on climate change are more likely, everything else being equal, to be impacted by that transition to a low carbon world than those with green, low greenhouse gas emissions. Now I say it's a, it's a proxy because of course we have to think across the whole supply chain. Corporates also need to assess how climate uh, affects in, impact them directly through their exposures to physical risks. And that can get quite complicated because it may not just be the location of their particular plants or um, you know, their operations, but they also need to think about the workers. Can they get to work if there's flooding? Um, they need to think about um, which infrastructure they're reliant on, be it electricity or water supply or whether they, they, they rely on a port. So it really gets quite complicated quite quickly. And what makes it even more complicated, of course, is that we don't know um, how the future will evolve. Um, a 
pretty standard uh, chart here. We've seen a, a variant of this already, and I'm sure you'll see it many times today. But the balance between the physical and transition risks depends crucially upon future temperature increases, which in turn depend upon net greenhouse gas emissions. So um, you can see that if we manage to um, bend the curve on emissions, uh, which we all hope we do, uh, we will have more transition risks. Um, and that, that will arise as we adjust towards a low carbon economy and they arise from things like new policies, uh, new legal challenges, technology changes and reputational risks. Um, there isn't just a risk side to this though, and we've already heard a little bit about it, quite inspiring stories um, throughout the, the, the conference so far about some of the opportunities. And, and this chart I just put up is from the TCFD. And you can see the categories of transition risks and physical risks on the one side alongside those opportunities. And what we're seeing now is a commercial imperative or a sort of awakening, if you like, of understanding of the commercial imperative of taking these risks and opportunities seriously. Um, we don't know the nature of the transition. It may be orderly, it may be disorderly, uh, but what we do know is that these risks are very real and that firms are beginning to really start to get to grips with them in quite a major way. The Global Association of Risk Professionals, I think it's quite telling that our first new product in 11 years is a certificate on sustainability and climate risk. We're probably best known for the financial risk manager certification. So that's kind of quite a quantitative um, and, and quite a deep uh, certification, a kind of master's level. This new certificate though uh, is not as quantitative, but it's, it's very telling, I think, that that's the area that we consider to be most uh, in need of urgent capability building. So let me just talk about how financial institutions are actually managing these risks. And I thought the best way to do it was just to go through some of the results from our second annual climate risk management survey. Now this survey is, um, it's structured broadly along the categories of the TCFD. It's not measuring how good the firms are at TCFD, but many of these categories are, if you like, the building blocks for good risk management, climate risk management. So uh, we ask about, you know, how good are the board here? Are the board and the senior management engaged? In terms of their strategy, have, has the firm assessed their risks and opportunities? Is climate risk integrated in day-to-day -day risk management? And then in terms of the kind of more detailed views, uh, is the firm, these are financial firms, remember, are they using metrics, targets and limits yet? Are they using scenario analysis? Are they doing anything with that scenario analysis? What are they disclosing and how advanced are they? Now, the last category, um, the disclosure one, isn't a direct measure of risk management. What we find is that firms that are disclosing tend to be more advanced. And maybe that's a kind of chicken and egg. You need to become more advanced to feel comfortable about disclosing. But whatever the reason, it certainly uh, is, is one of those indicators of, of more mature climate risk management practices. And I'll take you through just some highlights. You can, you can get the results on us on our website. But I would say I think this is reasonably um, representative. There will be a little bit of a bias because the kind of firms that take part in our survey are those that believe that they have something to answer and, and they want to be part of this global community. It is all anonymous. It's not a naming and shaming exercise remotely. It's an exercise for us to benchmark them, provide the firms back with uh, their information on where they stand relative to other financial firms. We had 71 firms take part this year uh, with, uh, that was 43 banks, 28 others, asset managers, insurance companies, and financial market infrastructure. And it's, it's quite sizable scale, 42 trillion uh, of assets on their balance sheets, 36 trillion of assets under management and a market cap of 3.8 trillion. So uh, some of the biggest financial firms in the world took part. And they're regionally, they operate across the globe. So that's also good because we get a good geographic spread. 
Okay, so I start with governance because it does all start with governance typically. Um, and in a sense, it's quite a dull um, slide, this one. But we find that board engagement has strengthened this year amongst these firms, with over 90% of them having board oversight, which is a slight increase from the previous year. Um, however, not all of those boards have actually seen papers or even been involved in discussions about climate change risks. So there's a little bit of a gap between, if you like, the formal, yes, the board's got responsibility, but actually what are they doing on that? The more advanced firms, um, the, the boards are actually having much deeper conversations now. Um, they're having board strategy offsites. They're getting climate risk specialists along to speak to them. Uh, some have considered climate risks in their ICAPs for banks, their capital assessments. They're reviewing disclosures. They're approving their uh, financing of uh, emission intensive sectors. They're so doing a range of different activities. Um, and I would say more so than the previous year. Um, we've talked about the opportunities and the risks. And uh, what's interesting is we've asked the firms, well, what do you expect to have? Uh, a, which do you expect to have a significant impact on your strategy? Is it from the risk side or is it from the opportunities side? And what I think is quite interesting is that these firms expect a significant impact on their strategy from climate opportunities. Certainly more firms do in the next five years. Beyond that, they're sort of equally balanced. And we also asked them about how resilient they felt their strategy was. And very few firms believe their strategy is resilient beyond 15 years, um, about 10 percent, only about 30 percent feel it's uh, resilient in the five to 15 years. So we are going to see changes um, uh, undoubtedly. And what you're beginning to see already is firms changing existing products, introducing new products and services because they see that the demand is there um, and the nature of those changes are different. It may be uh, a new sustainability linked loan or a green bond, or it may be tightening uh, insurance, uh, underwriting standards, whatever it will be, you are beginning to see those, those uh, changes uh, quite, quite rapidly um, being introduced. And one of the reasons that they need to introduce all of this and they need to start thinking about it pretty carefully um, is because um, very few of them believe that climate risk is priced or included in market prices. Um, and that could be for a number of different reasons. Um, partly the, 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 the challenge of measuring these risks, uh, the longer term nature of forecasting climate change and the impacts are so co complex. There is a lack of robust and reliable data. Um, there's no standardized metrics or methodologies. And it's difficult to combine that shorter term focus of pricing models with the longer term nature of climate risk. There's a whole range of reasons. But as these things are worked through, you will find that there could be very abrupt changes in prices and valuations, um, particularly in the back on the back of um, transition risk and new policies. So, you know, we could be in for quite a turbulent few years as relative prices, relative valuations change. And so firms do need to get ahead of that and start thinking very carefully about their exposure to climate risk within their existing portfolios. Um, one of the questions that risk professionals have is how do I embed it in my in my existing risk management framework? And they tend to have a choice. They can choose to treat climate risk as a principal risk, as a standalone risk or they can embed it within other risk types. And what we find in our survey is that 80% um, of the firms have chosen to embed climate risk within their existing risk types. So within credit risk, for example, market traded risk, operational risks. Um, and I'm not surprised that the, the most common one is credit risk because that's the one that probably has got the most attention and that's the one that's most obviously gonna be affected by transition risk. The other tool, of course, that firms need to develop uh, expertise in is scenario analysis, because just um, 
relating back to that first slide on scenarios that I showed you, we don't know what the future will be. And they are going to have to get used to kind of thinking about a variety of different futures. Um, climate risk scenario analysis uh, certainly becoming more widespread. Um, just under 60% of the firms have used it. You'll see here that very few are using it regularly. They tend to use it on an ad hoc basis, and that's because they are using it, uh, well, that those ones tend to be part of a pilot, say with the UNEPFI group, uh, or they're just beginning to use it. Uh, and I think what we'd like to see is more firms using it regularly as part of their business as usual risk management. Um, what's interesting is, you know, under six, just under 60% are using it, um, only about 30% have actually done anything as a, as a result of it. So it's not having that impact on business decisions and risk management decisions that it needs to have. Now, part of the reason for that is because many firms are facing uh, barriers and challenges to actually establishing this. And this chart just gives you a sense of what those barriers and challenges are in the near term up to the next five years in the top panel and longer term in the bottom panel. And I think what's interesting is uh, if you look at like the, the highly significant areas um, that's in the black bars, the availability of reliable models is seen as the key barrier in the next five years. And that's maybe because traditional risk management tools haven't been designed for the longer term nature. Um, but certainly longer term, that's an area where firms expect um, that those those problems will have been uh, resolved as new tools, technologies, uh, and methodologies are developed. Um, interestingly, the next big area of concern is regulatory uncertainty. And I think that is not particularly surprising, or I think it's very promising that the regulators and supervisors are collaborating, many of them, through the auspices of the NGFS, where they can share best practice, and hopefully that will drive some alignment Another one I would just pick out briefly is uh, the fourth bar along internal alignment on climate risk strategy. So what that means is that within the firms, it's quite difficult to get everybody lined up. So have you got your strategy people lined up with your risk people? Oh, finance? Um, I think somebody needs to go on mute. Um, uh, so getting everybody pointing in the same, same direction is something that the firms have to do, but it can take a little uh, bit of time. And, and I'll come back to the time challenge in a second. So what do we do with all of these insights? Well, what we want to do, particularly for the firms, is we want to give them some sort of ranking, if you like, on how good are they and where do they stand um, with the other firms or relative to the other firms. So what we do is we've created a maturity model and we score the firms. And so I just wanted to give you very quick headlines on this. Um, this shows you that um, uh, there is a wide distribution of uh, expertise and just group them in groups of five here from you know, some of the very best firms scoring well into the 500s. Each part of the survey uh, scores hundreds and so, so um, Firms are scored out of 100 for each category. That distribution, though, basically shows you that uh, the most advanced firms tend to be the ones that were talking, uh, that introduced this climate risk discussions in the firm uh, longer ago. In other words, the ones that started earlier are the better ones these days. And what we've found when we've dug into the scores a little bit more is that we can, we can think about uh, in a sense, kind of two, two aspects of this. There's um, the foundations and next steps. So the foundations are the categories governance, strategy and risk management. And that's where we found the scoring didn't differ so much between what we call the climate risk leaders and, and the, the followers. But it's really in these next steps, the use of metrics, targets, limits, scenario analysis and disclosures. That's really the differentiator. And that's where the ones that started earlier have got more time, have had more time to establish this. 
So you can read um, read up about the the, the the full results in this uh, in this publication on our website. I would just pick out a few things that board governance is is absolutely critical, but it's not sufficient. Um, we've got this distinction between foundational elements, uh, governance, risk management, strategy, and those what the leading firms are doing. Um, I think it's interesting and almost quite inspiring that opportunities are seen to outweigh the risks in the short term. I'm not sure that that's right, but anyway, that's the impact on their strategy is seen to going to be really heavily influenced by the opportunities. Climate risk is improperly priced, though, um, and so we have to build capability and awareness. So I'll just leave you with two two last slides. One. Um, which is a series of publications that came out under the uh, leadership of the Climate Financial Risk Forum in the UK. Um, this was set up by the two regulators, the PRA and the FCA, to build capability or ca capacity and share best practice. And GARP acted at the Secretariat for the Risk Management and Scenario Analysis Working Groups, and we saw a, a great deal of collaboration both between industry players and with the regulators. And I think that was a very interesting way to accelerate learning. Uh, and finally, um, I had to put up a few of our um, resources, a little bit of a plug for what we're doing, because uh, as I mentioned, it's the first new product from GARP in 11 years. And I think it's extremely telling that we chose to focus on sustainability and climate risk. Uh, we do publish quite a lot of uh, white papers and research and we're, uh, we, we um, showcase other people's excellent work and we have podcasts and webcasts and that all sort of thing. We also um, put together a little training uh, module for the Climate Disclosure Standards Board, which is uh, housed on the TCFD Knowledge Hub, because we recognise that actually the more knowledge and capability building there is across all sectors of the economy, the better it will be for financial firms. So that that training course is not just for fi financial uh, or risk professionals. And the other thing I just uh, just highlight is we have a symposium coming up in November. It's a two parter. The first one in November the November the tenth has got three leading regulators to talk about what they are um, what they're doing in climate risk. So we have Sarah Breeden who will also talk about the work of the NGFS, Kevin Starrow from the New York Fed um, and Arthur Ewan from the HKMA. So they'll be talking about the regulation. And then the next Tuesday, we will be running a climate risk scenario game. And I have no idea how that's gonna work virtually, but what we want to do is we want to highlight the nature of the risks that firms in the real economy are going to be faced with. Uh, so the audience will be the board and they will be taking decisions. And it's been quite difficult to write the scenario, I must admit. Um, and I think it's going to be a learning experience um, for everyone, even if it's just don't ever do that again, because it just doesn't work virtually, but we'll see. But I'm looking forward to that. Uh, and thank you very much for today's uh, opportunity to talk to you all. Thank you, Ms. Paisley. We continue today's event with a panel discussion. However, before doing so, let us first take a small survey to see what our audience thinks about the topic. If somebody is watching the stream in full screen mode, please switch to normal mode while voting. Our question is on the screen. Are financial institutions and companies in Central Europe already sufficiently aware of the negative impacts of climate change on their business? The possible answer is A, yes, or B, no. Please submit your vote now. And the result is B. It appears that the majority thinks that market players are not yet sufficiently aware of the risks coming from climate change for their business.
The discussion will be moderated by Linda Zeilina, CEO of International Sustainable Finance Center. The International Sustainable Finance Center is a brand new, a political impact-driven think tank whose aim is to carry out independent research on sustainable finance topics. It acts as a knowledge and networking hub, bringing together some of the brightest minds working on sustainability and finance. Linda, the floor is yours. Thank you and welcome to the panel discussion. Thank you all the presenters for fantastic presentations touching up upon so many interesting aspects of climate and environmental risk, a topic of growing importance for banking. And especially in the light of COVID-19 outbreak, which has in various forms been called potentially a green swan event, or a very early and mild example of what might eventually be called a climate Minsky moment when climate change triggers a financial meltdown or a prolonged crisis, we face a very interesting time full of uncertainty and um, new lessons when some of the policy taboos have been broken when modern monetary theory, theory is getting more um, discussed. So in light of what's been happening, what, if any, lessons do you believe has the virus outbreak provided for banking and for central banks in particular? I would like to start with uh, Mayun, please, and uh, we will continue from there. Thank you. Can you hear me? Linda, I assume you can hear me, right? The floor is yours. Great. Um, I think uh, the uh, climate impact uh, is going to be much, much bigger than the COVID impact on the economy. It's not in the same league. Uh, the COVID is a relatively short-term phenomenon, uh, whether you know, within one year or one and a half years, I think we will be able to fix it when the vaccine is available. But uh, uh, if the climate change continues at the current pace, the uh, uh, temperature rising, for example, four or five degrees within this century, I think uh, the sea level is going to increase by many meters and uh, hundreds of millions of people uh, could become refugees. They will lose their living space, especially those in the coastal areas. And uh, large areas of the world will suffer serious drought conditions and they will have no food. And again, uh, this situation will lead to a lot of uh, refugees as well. So in terms of uh, the dislocation of economic activities, the hunger it may generate, and uh, uh, the uh, fact that uh, so many people will be losing their homes. I think uh, the aggregate impact on the economy uh, is going to be uh, many, many multiples of the COVID impact. And therefore, the impact on the financial system uh, is going to be much bigger as well and much more long uh, lasting. Uh, that's why I think uh, uh, even though climate change is a longer term issue, uh, we have to face it uh, with um, you know, sufficient attention and act very quickly. Otherwise, I think in you know, five or 10 years later, if we begin to realize this is a risk, it's going to be too late. Thank you. Would uh, Mattia Romani like to add something? Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Linda. Uh, I'm no central banker, so Majun, I'm, I'm sure it's much better place to address this question. but. You know, what I observe is that in the wake of the of the COVID crisis, of course, banks are embarking on this uh, continued quantitative easing measures. Somehow the normal goals of central banking, financial stability, of course, inflation targeting, but also an eye on full employment uh, in a moment of crisis like this, trump everything. So the danger is that we see this measure being put in place in a way which is biased against climate and not even realize that and actually worsen our ability to use the financial systems to tilt to green in a moment in which we really desperately need it. So I think we ought to 
and I'm very glad to hear that the network for the uh, uh, so the uh, so greening of the financial systems is working so hard on this topic. I think we have to make sure the central banks still um, are ready for that sort of climate Minsky moment, you know, that moment in which things may change drastically. Um, I think, I think uh, Joe was mentioning the fact when asset pricing will change in a non-linear fashion because of the climate risks being realized in the economy. So maybe some questions to consider uh, for central banks are whether through prudential measures they can do something, for example, risk weight for asset classes and how central banks should treat green instruments. So we know, for example, regulators in China, Majun can tell us more about that, I'm sure, have devised these different tiers of green assets. And if financial institutions hold higher amounts of top tier green assets, then their reserves held at the central banks are remunerated at higher interest rates. So they have an, you know, an incentive to hold higher tier green assets. So this type of prudential measures may work. Um, we also may, may ask ourselves whether central banks, in a moment in which they're doing quite a lot of buying of assets in the, in the market, should they buy directly green financial assets, like green government bonds or even green corporate bonds? If we are keen to keep the interest rates low at the longer end of the yield curve for this instrument, then we may want to consider whether there are enough volumes of such long-dated green instrument, incentivize this long-dated green instrument. So, in other words, even in a moment of deep financial crisis like the one we're facing now, where central banks rightly have their eye on their traditional objectives, I think there are ways of tilting to green through the regulation of central banks that must be explored. Thank you, Mattia. Fantastic points. Also touching upon whether uh, central bank demand can then create that very um, useful supply of more green assets, which is another discussion in itself. Uh, Joe, would you have anything to add before we move on to the next question? Uh, well, I agree with um, uh, both both the speakers. I think I fear that maybe people haven't kind of quite drawn the link between COVID and, and climate. Um, and that they are so focused on the near term, uh, they may not be drawing those longer term implications. I know from um, you know many chief risk officers that they are pretty overwhelmed with just dealing with this crisis, and and that concerns me because I think, as Marjan says, that climate change will be far uh, more you know significant and will have deeper impacts. One thing I think is quite interesting about the COVID experience is I've, I've heard of uh, chief risk officers who, you know, they had a pandemic playbook, they'll get it off the shelf, they started looking at it and they realised that it didn't help them at all manage the risks in, in the pandemic. Not to say that it wasn't a good thing to have done, but it just played out so differently, so fast uh, and was so much more intense than they expected. They had to build uh, they had to be agile to deal with it. They had to communicate with their staff a lot more. They had to think of different ways of working. Um, and I think that we don't know how the climate crisis will play out, but we do know that we have to cut emissions. That's the one thing we do know. So it is completely foreseeable. Um, and I increasingly think that, uh, you know, that's got to be the focus, uh, you know, supporting that transition and, and having our, our eye on that net zero goal. Um, because otherwise you're going to be left with some pretty difficult risks on your balance sheet that you will not be able to manage. You will not be able to hedge. So um, I hope people draw the parallels. I hope they understand the need for uh, more agility. Um, and, I, and I hope that they're starting to see just how important and significant this risk could be. Fantastic. Thank you, Joe. Uh, so that is an interesting uh, question about how do we actually link that and translate what is happening into a coherent narrative to link COVID to climate change and to use that as an opportunity maybe to expand that knowledge and understanding. So currently we've touched upon this during the discussion as well about um, the current risk management frameworks not being necessarily always adequate. Um, especially with the rise of a risk that maybe didn't exist when they were 
initially devised. So there's been a long discussion uh, in the background about whether we need enhanced climate stress tests. So I was wondering whether in your opinion, should we be rethinking the carbon stress tests that we use to make them more forward looking? Should we be rethinking the frameworks to avoid potentially miss the fact that we might be missing significant buildups of climate related risks within the system? And would such improved frameworks potentially help us also to devise better prudential measures for improved risk mitigation? And as Mattia mentioned, actually, um, the People's Bank of China has included in the evaluation of banks' green performance, they have included that within their uh, macroprudential assessment framework. So have, have these incentives worked well in the past and what else could we be doing? So once again, let's start with Mayun and then we're going to proceed with the others. Thank you. Um, now, in terms of uh, the use of green supporting factor, um, and you named uh, one of the examples in China, which is the uh, MPA, Macro Potential Assessment, uh, uh, which was introduced uh, in 2017. And under that uh, uh, scheme, the Central Bank in China evaluated the green performance of commercial banks by measuring the percentage of the green loans uh, in total loans and also the uh, growth rate of green loans. If a commercial bank has a high percentage of green loans, and the high growth of green loan, it gets a high score of MPA, uh, which uh, may translate into financial incentives from the central bank to the commercial bank. Um, now this scheme has been introduced, uh, but it's hard to sort of quantify the impact of that. It's almost like, uh, you know, uh, the mommy was telling the boy, you're doing a great job and then giving you a high score, big hug, you know, that kind of incentive. Uh, so far has not translated into material financial incentive and uh, we really don't know how to use econometrics to quantify the impact of such a big hug. Um, but other measures are uh, relatively more easy to be quantified, for example, uh, in terms of interest subsidies, uh, which the Chinese local government, local authorities have introduced. Um, uh, they believe um, such interest subsidies by roughly 50 basis points for green projects uh, could substantially enhance the green loan growth. Um, just give you one case in Hojo City, which is a pilot program for green finance. Um, after they introduced such an interest subsidy, their green loan growth went up to about 30% per year in the past three years. And uh, I would say before that, it's probably 10, 15%. So uh, that's how you know, can see visible impact of some incentive or green supporting factor to the uh, green behavior of financial institutions. Uh, but there are many other green supporting factors we can consider. For example, I think Mattia talked about green QE, uh, which is a, a fairly easy tool uh, that many uh, central banks uh, can use because they're doing a lot of QEs already. I uh, just need to you know, uh, give a little bit more resource to green uh, assets, including green bonds. And the other thing is about the collateral requirements, uh, which we can twist mm -hmm. towards in favor of green for example, including some of the green bonds into eligible collateral for the central bank that could help enhance the demand for such a green assets. And uh, uh, the other thing I would say, a uh, very important tool for the regulator and central bank is to encourage disclosure of green and the brown asset information of financial institutions. Once the central bank or financial regulators require the bank's insurance company institution investors to disclose for example, the brown exposure, um, that's gonna force them to conduct forward-looking analysis, such as stress testing, scenario analysis, because it's a major reminder from regulator that you are exposed. You have to do something to take care of your risk. And that's why you have to know how much risk you are taking. Fantastic. Uh, Mopia, would you like to add anything, especially about um the suitability of the current climate stress tests? Uh, well, look, I'm gonna uh, listen on this one because Maju knows a lot and Joe is the is the queen of stress testing. So I'm really curious to see her, hear her views. I'll only say one word of how important it is that the IMF steps into this space very strongly 
and starts issuing some guidance and standards on uh, uh, climate stress testing. Of course, they're doing quite a lot of work on this, but I think more can be done. But as I said, I'll leave it to the experts. So I'm really curious to hear Joe's views. Thank you, Mattia. We will return with a question specifically for you um, after this anyway. Uh, Joe, um, what are uh, Well, um, I've never been called the queen of stress testing, which is a bit alarming. Um, but I, I, I actually am a big fan of stress testing. Um, I think that when it comes to climate, anything that promotes greater awareness around the risks has to be a good thing. And I think that firms should be doing multiple stress tests. I think they should be looking at Paris aligned 1.5 degrees and a hothouse world. Um, because partly by understanding the assumptions, by understanding the, the risks involved in, in the transition, for example, and the physical risks that will you know, likely occur as, as the world heats up, you tend to find that people are so horrified, they'll do everything they can to stop that uh, hothouse world. And so that in itself is incredibly valuable. When it comes to regulatory stress tests, um, I've always been quite vocal about the need for alignment uh, and harmonization. What we don't want to do is create a patchwork of compliance exercises, which are nothing to do with risk management and they're nothing to do about you know, reducing the impacts of climate change uh, or even managing them. It's just to do with form filling and that would be the worst of all possible worlds. Um, so I've seen already regulators are starting to come out with their own uh, frameworks. They need to work together incredibly closely so that they can get a sense of the risks to their own financial institutions. But climate change is the ultimate global problem. And if you've got uh, different stress tests on different bases which don't work together, you can't compare the results. And frankly, it's almost like a waste of time. It's worse than not doing them, in my view, uh, because you're just diverting resources um, to looking locally where actually you need to look globally and you need to look consistently as well and coherently. So there is a danger, in my view, of uh, every regulator racing to create their own framework. I think that a number of them um, can learn from one another. So there needs to be transparency in the assumptions and the approaches across regulators. And then maybe they could share results more freely um, uh, so that actually they they try and do this in a in a really cost efficient way. So I am a great fan of stress tests, but I would like a balance between firms running their own scenarios, and disclosing them, disclosing them is critical. Um, uh, but let's make sure we don't overdo the regulatory ones, because what tends to happen is they become compliance exercises. Uh, and that's the last thing we need at the moment. Thank you, Joe. A very valid point also about the need for more companies to disclose their um, climate stress tests. Sadly, that is uh, not the case because of the perceived damage to reputation or potential uh, negative effects that I guess some fear that might result when um, when the market sees that they actually might be at greater risk of transition. So we do have a specific question for Mattia. So since um, EBRD's mandate comprises the purpose that includes fostering change in economic systems to make markets competitive, also to create inclusive and environmentally friendly growth. So how do you actually see the Central European regions progress in terms of green transition. What are the main opportunities and barriers that you have witnessed within the region? Well, thanks, Linda. Uh, as you know, as you know, uh, for the EBRD, the Central European region is the core region. It's the region we know we know best, we love, and we're committed to. Um, so. The commitment continues, as I said earlier, EBRD has de facto become a green bank with, as I said, a target over half of our investments going directly into supporting countries and our clients in the private sector uh, in the transition to low carbon 
low carbon economy. And if anything, last week's board of governors not only unanimously approved the strategic objective and this roadmap, but urged us to do even more than that 50% of our investments. So our region and Central Europe will be at the heart of that strategic mission, but it faces some real special challenges. I mean, first, um, you saw that chart I showed in my presentation, the concentration in the ter European territory of assets at risk and jobs at risk is uh, in Central Eastern Europe when it comes to the transition to low carbon economy. So we can see, and we can only take Poland as an example, uh, we can see that in regions that are dependent on coal, the risks for you know thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, people employed in these industries are substantially being affected by this transition. I think we need to go into that challenge with the eyes wide open. If we don't manage the political economy of the transition, if we don't manage um, the tensions that this will create, if we don't uh, if we don't remember not to leave people behind this transition, this transition will not happen at the speed we need it to happen. That's why at EBRD, and that's to answer your question, in this region we're um, starting this initiative called the Just Transition Initiative. We launched it uh, in July and this is really around ensuring that vulnerable countries, regions and people do not fall behind. And we do this by trying to see if assets can be repurposed from fossil fuels to different users. We looked at reskilling a workforce in the private sector to ensure that people can be reskilled and upskilled to work in different sectors if their sectors are being shut down in the process of uh, transition to low carbon economy. And simply by making um, the investment climate in regions that are very dependent on one activity related to fossil fuels, able to attract a diverse set of activities that creates a diverse set of jobs. Um, and we started doing it in our very little way, project by project, it was, as we do at EBRD. We invested just last week, we signed a 75 million euros investment in Help as Solar. This is a large 200 megawatt solar plant right next to an existing and functioning coal fired power station in Greece. In fact, in the Western Macedonia region of Greece, as you know, Greece has committed very strongly to shut down its coal fired power plants. So this station will be decommissioned in the next few years. We have already got a solar plant right on site to create jobs and opportunities for the people that will be put at risk during the transition out of coal in Greece. So that's the kind of challenge that I think Central Europe, Southeastern Europe uh, will face. Let me tell you a second characteristic of the region uh, that I believe uh, is very peculiar. Well, not very peculiar, but makes it challenging. So the financial system in uh, Central Europe is dominated by subsidiary of EU banks. These banking groups have diverse challenges across the different countries. Subsidiaries are located in different countries, are very diverse. It's a patchwork, a regularly patchwork, very difficult to manage from the EU banks that own many of the banks in the region, the subs in the, in the subsidiaries in the region. Now, we need better uh, regulations to ensure that this banking sector is ready to support the transition in Central, in Central Europe through its subs and branches. And here, the regulations between EU and outside EU matters greatly. We have a little platform called the Vienna Initiative. It helped us a lot during the financial crisis. And of course, uh, our friends in Budapest, they're very familiar with the works of the Vienna Initiative. It worked very well as uh, many banks uh, uh, deleveraged themselves uh, out of uh, Central Europe during the previous financial crisis. Now, this initiative is a work stream which is exactly on that, to ensure that EU banks prepare branches and subs in Central Europe, sometimes outside, even the Eurozone. They help, the, they help ensure the subs are ready to support the private sector in the transition to low carbon economy. And the Vienna Initiative will be the instruments that EBRD will, will use to help that. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Mattia. I believe um, from what I know, you might need to leave now since it's 11 a.m. Um, so thank you so much for your points. Um, absolutely fantastic to have you and uh, safe travels. Thank you.
Thank you, Linda, Majun, and uh, and Joe. I am doing something very unusual these days. I have to uh, go get a flight, believe it or not. So uh, <laughs> yes, so thank you, and I'm sorry I have to leave early. Apologies. Thank you. So um, on that note, we'll continue with a slightly different question. And since we only have a little bit less than five minutes left, so let's um, try and split it two minutes and two minutes between you both. So a question that um, has been also gaining a bit more attention lately is whether a brown taxonomy or the application of a brown penalizing factor in the collateral framework would actually improve risk management uh, in banks. So I was wondering if Mayun could start with his thoughts on the subject and then um, Joe can wrap up as the queen of stress testing. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, uh, actually, there's some kind of a brown taxonomy already in China. Um, back a few years ago, the banking regulator has introduced a, a list of sectors which are considered as uh, highly polluting, uh, energy intensive, and overcapacity. So it's a Chinese way of describing, you know, what we believe as uh, uh, the brown sectors. Um, now the problem is that uh, such a list uh, is not very um, frequently updated. And uh, we indeed need to update them according to the priority of the uh, environmental climate agenda, according to changing, um, you know, the actual conditions in the sectors and so on. Um, and also we need to enhance uh, the uh, carbon or climate related elements uh, in the design of such a taxonomy. I think, uh, you know, many countries and regulators may have to consider their own definition of brown taxonomy and introduce such taxonomy to their financial institutions so that uh, uh, these financial firms will be able to classify at least within the country in a consistent way of uh, their brown exposure. Uh, the problem is that uh, uh, so many institutions are defining the green and brown by themselves. Uh, I heard that uh, from, this is a discussion from ISO, uh, there are currently like 200 kinds of green taxonomies. I'm not sure how many kinds of brown taxonomy there are. Uh, there must be many uh, because a lot of institutions are doing its own uh, definition. Uh, that's why I think there's a need for some sort of harmonization. Uh, whether across markets or uh, at least within the country, uh, within a major market to be you know, unified. Uh, that will facilitate uh, the uh, risk uh, uh, measurement and the risk analysis. Fantastic, thank you. Joe, would you like to add um, from your perspective, would that be useful or how should we be thinking about this? Uh, well, I think that if there's, certainly if there's greater clarity around the risks, then that has to help risk management and taxonomy is a part of it. It sounds like we need a taxonomy of taxonomies though. Um, but I think that that's just one part of it, isn't it? Because we also need better quality data, more standardized data uh, from corporates in particular. Um, and there's the dynamic nature of this as well, because actually the risks from something that looks brown today, but uh, has a very clear path to green uh, are very different than a sort of, you know, maybe a less brown asset that, that's going to be stubbornly brown throughout. So we need to think about how to get that forward looking aspect into that, because that's really what's critical for the for the risk management. Now, if I may add just one point, as Linda asked earlier about the penalizing factor for brown, uh, this is a subject that we discussed together with uh, the supporting factor for green uh, during the NGFS discussion and many other forums. Um, there are a couple of difficulties here. Uh, at the time, we discussed the need for introducing green brown taxonomy and to um, penalize brown and incentivize green. Um, the first problem is, uh, uh, can you show that uh, the green assets default less compared with the brown assets? Um, that's what most of the financial regulator would ask. Uh, if the answer is yes, then they may consider by reducing risk weights for green and increasing risk weights for brown, uh, because that adjustment is consistent with the uh, objective of financial stability related policies. Now, the problem is that if you want to uh, measure the risks, you have to define the, uh, the green and brown first, right? You have to collect the data on the underlying assets and then uh, you need to collect the uh, default information. Without taxonomy, you are not able to 
uh, quantify the risks. Even if you have a taxonomy and quantify the risk for certain country, for example, I use the Chinese data uh, to show some of my colleagues and saying that uh, in China in the past five years, we indeed have shown that the green assets default much less than assets of other colors. Um, but uh, the reaction that it's only from one country, it may not apply to many other countries. And the other reaction that uh, such data is backward looking because you're showing me historical data. We're not sure about uh, uh, green assets will default less in the future compared with brown assets. And the uh, other challenges include uh, uh, the simple comparison of default rates between green and brown uh, may not capture uh, really the impact of the uh, color of the assets. It may reflect many other characteristics of the financial operation. For example, the project owners are different. Uh, that's why uh, the default rates are different. So I think there are many, many problems uh, of such a sort of a, a assumption that uh, we have to make sure green assets default less than brown. Uh, that's uh, the basis for introducing uh, penalizing factor for brown and uh, uh, introducing supporting factor for green. I think uh, uh, at some point we may have to think about uh, this is just a belief uh, that in the future climate change will lead uh, to a much higher default rate of a lot of high carbon assets. And based on belief, we have to introduce something. Fantastic. On that very powerful note, I think we will wrap up this session. Thank you both for great insights. And um, yes, I believe we will have a short break now. Thank you very much. Thank you, Linda, and all the panel participants. Ladies and gentlemen, we will take a short coffee break now. Those who can stay with us during the break can enjoy some inspiring videos about the US principles for responsible banking, an initiative the Central Bank of Hungary has endorsed this year. We will continue the conference in 10 minutes at 11.15. Thank you. I truly believe that the next 30 years of our economy, of our society, can't be like the last 30 years. How many crises do we need um, before we start reacting? Sustainability uh, means survival uh, in the long run for every institution. I don't see a world doing business or a bank doing business in the future without considering the importance of sustainability. Yeah, it's very if we want to achieve society's goals, we need to think beyond traditional banking. This movement is showing the world that you can be a good entity that's supporting good communities and still be financially sustainable. There's actually real power in working with each other to support each other, to drive change together. What we have done is to identify seven impact areas. We are building a civil society advisory body. Entonces, en el segmento de microfinanzas desarrollamos un pool de indicadores sociales. We're looking at projects that will deliver quite major land use change to um, provide climate change resilience through uh, improved front defenses. The experiences we gained from the Australian National Outlook Project in, in stakeholder engagement, I think will stay with us for um, a very long time. When so many people actually come together and say, this is the way we need to cooperate to do good, um, then we realize that the change is really possible. It's not to damage business, it's to make business better. More and more banks are getting this and are understanding that their long-term success is indeed understanding that society's success goes along with it. When every bank employee and every bank around the world understands how 
their decisions affect society, affect the environment, and makes their decisions accordingly, does their work accordingly, interacts with clients accordingly, that's the moment when we've succeeded. COVID has really taught the world that we need to listen to everyone. This movement is showing the world that you can do good and you can be a good entity that's supporting good communities and still be financially sustainable. Since the COVID came in, overall I would say that we see activities subdued. Uh, our performance has been driven by loans. Growth has been quite challenged. We've had to restructure a lot of our customers so face challenges in all, in, in all sectors, from hospitality, transport, tourism, schools, and many others. It's very important that th those companies receive not just the working capital they need for the recovery phase, but also the investments they need to make to be more productive. It is our job in this, in this group to focus on listening to our customers and diagnosing the situation and being able to provide an equitable and fair solution. Being a signatory of the principles for responsible banking give us a framework on how we can help going through these times and, and help through the recoveries. De ser firmante de los principios y poder demostrarle a los clientes que hay mucha consistencia entre lo que hacemos y lo que decimos es una es una oportunidad muy valiosa para para el banco y para sus clientes. Under the COVID Emergency Fund program, which was set up by you know in March, one of the biggest realization when the fund was set up was how, what is the impact for economic impact for communities and livelihoods. So you think of the payment protection plan. Banks were notified, and within a few days we had to build a portal create it and manage it and process it. We did we did all of that over one weekend. With the principles of, of, of responsible banking, how we, through financial inclusion, putting in service our digital platforms could make the difference, not helping people to save, but also allowing them to access credit in a different way. Pues, sencillamente, sin Si, si el banco no hubiese actuado de la forma que ha actuado, saliendo a tiempo, oportuna y con, con las acciones adecuadas, muchas de estas compañías ya hoy no existirían. I cannot tell you how many nights I sat here just hearing the gratitude of folks who didn't know where their next day was going to be. We need to focus on every client and every walk of life and every small business and have everyone have an equitable seat at the table in order to really effectively support our economy. The number of banks that uh, became founding signatories of the Principles for Responsible Banking was way beyond our wildest expectations. Independently from each other, they had developed the same vision. They all wanted a banking system that was really in the service of society, that very clearly contributed to the goals for a sustainable future. You cannot have a healthy economy in a planet that is not healthy, in a society that is not healthy and is not happy. Banking is all about reputation. And people are understanding more and more the importance. We need to become drivers of the culture change that is going on. It's about building trust with our stakeholders, about building trust um, with society. We need to shift the whole sector from not just thinking about risk in terms of climate change, uh, but we need to think the whole, uh, rethink the whole sector to take responsibility for impact and to really own the challenges that society faces, particularly aligning themselves around the sustainable development goals. Hence that the financial sector has a really central role to play in achieving the necessary transition to a more sustainable economy. Um, I mean, there was no option not to be part of it. <laughs> Let's put it like this. It provides us with a common set of uh, principles, with a common language. We have to work together. This isn't divisive and about an institution making profit. We can't change what is going on as a single entity. So if we're working on similar topics and in similar lines of thinking, 
then indeed we can be this catalyst as a sector to change things. That alignment has really meant that we can accelerate the execution of our social, economic and environmental strategy. Be more focused, be more precise, and also to compare with other financial institutions around the world. Methodologies around climate risk, for example, such a great opportunity for us to learn, but also how can we contribute to banks that are earlier, at earlier phases of their um, program as well. It's another message to all of our stakeholders and our members and clients that we are more and more convinced and serious in the way we want to contribute to uh, uh, clean energy, climate change, and also build a stronger environment in our society. It gives them an enormous amount of pride. It makes them want to do business with us. It makes them want to potentially leave other banks that haven't adopted the principles. It's not just about going to work every day. Uh, it's going to work to really make a difference long term. Ladies and gentlemen, we continue today's conference. Let me introduce Katalin Sipos, director of WWF Hungary, who will describe the approach how the carbon footprint of the Central Bank of Hungary is offset through an ecological project. Katalin Sipos, the CEO of WWF Hungary, graduated as a biologist and has been working in nature conversation for over two decades. She started working in 1998 and gained professional experience working for the Danube Ipoli National Park Directorate. In 2015, she joined WWF Hungary as CEO and focuses on a climate and nature policy, partnership developments, environmental innovation and raising awareness in addition to her senior management role. Thank you very much for the introduction and for the opportunity to be here. It's a great honor. As you already mentioned, I'm a biologist, so I will talk about basically the ecological aspects of why investing in nature is a good idea and what benefits we can gain from that. Uh, my presentation will also follow uh, the commitment of the Hungarian Central Bank on carbon neutrality. Uh, since we have this joint project on the carbon offsetting, I will uh, shortly introduce this. But instead of focusing the technical details, I will more talk about the concept behind this uh, project. Whenever we talk about carbon neutrality, uh, the very first thing that we have to underline is that uh, the, the first, the most important thing to do is, is uh, the reduction of the carbon emission. Carbon offsetting is an acceptable measure for the residual uh, carbon emission, but it cannot replace the carbon cut. And the reason for this is that we have been emitting carbon dioxide uh, since the beginning of the industrial revolution. So since the second half of the 18th century, so there's already a huge amount of carbon dioxide accumulated in the atmosphere. 
And uh, considering the fact that the natural carbon capture capacity of the planet is as limited as the natural resources, we have to use these uh, offsetting, natural offsetting potential primarily to the gas which is already in the atmosphere. So this is the reason why uh, we have to focus on the reduction of the carbon footprint first, and then we can talk about the offsetting. Uh, one more important thing that we have to keep in mind is that uh, the reduction of the carbon uh, emission is a continuous search for opportunities. So uh, the ambition that we commit to today may, became, may become uh, insufficient within a few years. And it's because of the very rapid uh, development of the technologies and the very rapid change and transformation of our everyday life. So it's not a uh, once done exercise, we have to con continue the thinking how we can reduce the carbon footprint. Besides this, we have to talk about the fact that we face two uh, environmental crises nowadays. In the center of our thinking and discussion, uh, it's of often the global warming, which is caused by the uh, excess uh, carbon dioxide emission. But we should not forget that there is a natural crisis as well, the loss of nature. Uh, the indicators and reports about this are very serious and uh, describes a critical situation. Let me just refer to one uh, indicator. It's uh, in the Living Planet report of WWF, uh, of which the latest uh, uh, issue was published this September and uh, the key indicator, the Living Planet Index says that the amount of vertebrate animals uh, has decreased by 86% since the 70s, so only within the last uh, 50 years, which is a very, very serious uh, sign. What we can do with the loss of nature, uh, besides saving and protecting everything that remained until now, we have to give uh, land back to nature. It's, it's something that we surely have to do. This is what we call the reconstruction of habitats when uh, a degraded area, an arable land or uh, a former mining place or similar uh, sites are transformed back uh, to natural uh, status and can uh, restart their functions uh, in, in, eco in ecological sense. The good news is that nature, besides a lot of uh, functions, nature is also a good offsetting uh, tool. Let's put it this way. So still the best carbon capture, capture technology in the lack of other technical solution. So with reconstructing nature and reconstructing habitats, Practically, we can also answer the problem of uh, carbon capture. Looking a bit deeper into the multiple benefits of uh, natural habitats, as I mentioned, carbon offsetting potential is there. You can see here on the left side of this slide uh, two examples, how a natural forest and how a wetland can uh, uh, sequestrate the, the carbon. You can see that there's a difference in the, in the scale, in the volume of the carbon capture potential and also in the dynamics, but uh, it is uh, uh, extremely important that practically all elements of a natural habitat can capture carbon dioxide. So both the vegetation, the soil, the water bodies, even the dead wood in the forest, can capture carbon dioxide and store it for the long run. And that's also something which we often forget that it's not just uh, capturing it, it's also storaging it for the long run. This is the key for, for the long-term carbon neutrality. This side, what is very important, particularly important, is that besides the carbon sequestration potential, natural habitats hold a series of very important functions. Here you can see on the right side how they are grouped. There are provisioning, regulating, supporting, and culture ecosystem services. This is how we call it. And of course, we know pretty well the provisioning ones. It's like food and uh, um, firewood and drinking water and uh, 
medical resources. So these are the uh, assets and resources of nature which is actually traded and priced. So we can talk about these even within our uh, economy. While the other ones, uh, the regulating, the supporting and cultural ones, are less recognized and uh, very frankly speaking, the, despite the growing importance of these functions, we still uh, haven't included them in the right way to the uh, systems of our economy. Uh, under the, in the group of regulating functions, there are very particularly important ones like the micro, microclimate regulation or the protection against uh, flash floods or uh, the pollination or the soil uh, formation. So these functions are important not just for um, the different uh, economic sectors like uh, the agriculture or uh, the food production, but it's important also for mitigating the negative impacts of climate change. And let's just very shortly uh, introduce this uh, small pilot that we initiated together with the Hungarian Central Bank. It's a uh, uh, one and a half uh, hectare large area in the uh, northwest of Hungary. And the goal, the role of this site is to capture the carbon emission of the last year's Green Finance Conference coming mainly from the international flights. It was 120 tons of carbon dioxide. It's not a huge amount, but as I mentioned, it's really a pilot, so uh, a learning uh, uh, project for us. How we can link uh, uh, the reconstruction of nature with uh, uh, the uh, carbon offsetting. Uh, the solution that we chose here is to plant a, a native uh, forest and mainly alder uh, mixed deciduous forest to the site which was formerly a very degraded land. So you can see here that it was used for illegal waste deposit and it was actually infested with uh, alien invasive species. The real uh, important learnings we collected from this pilot and actually we uh, set a list of criteria which can ensure the long-term uh, viability ecological viability of such projects and I, I'd like to highlight only a few of these. One thing is whenever we talk about uh, natural investment, ecological investment, we always have to select that habitat type which fits perfectly to the biogeographic conditions of the specific site which we want to reconstruct and it's because this choice will determine the long-term self-maintenance, the long-term self-regeneration potential of our investment, which is very strongly linked with the, with the fact how much money we'll need for the maintenance on the long run and how much this will be able to provide these ecological services. Another important thing and also uh, very strongly linked to this long-term um, um, self-maintenance potential is that we have to prevent the site from every future potential harmful land uses. So we always set up uh, a legal instrument to prevent the harmful land use changes. It can be a local protection, it can be a very restrictive development category or anything else, but we have to keep in mind that it's important. And last but not least, it's very, it's always recommended to uh, make an inclusive project for, from the very beginning. So uh, involve the local municipality, involve the local people and search those opportunities which can be a direct service for them besides the ecosystem services. And I'd like to finish my presentation with uh, one shot from the video of uh, uh, WWF uh, uh, Living Planet Report. It, it was the uh, accompanying video of this uh, report. Nature is our align and not our enemy. I think we have started to understand that nature is not an obstacle for the economic development but uh, a fundamental pillar for that. And actually here we all and uh, in front of the um, screens uh, you all have an invitation to be part of the Game Changers community and uh, help this change. Uh, on the connection between humanity and the planet and nature. 
Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Sripas. Now let's continue the conference with the second section, which will deal with the post-COVID recovery and in particular with the question to what extent it can be greened. The topic will be addressed by Chaba Kondrac, Sean Kidney and Gurbus Gonul. First, I would like to invite Chaba Kondrac to give his presentation. Mr. Kondrac is Deputy Governor of Financial Institutions Supervision and Consumer Protection at the Central Bank of Hungary and a member of, of the Monetary Council. Prior to that, he had various senior management roles, including President of the Hungarian Treasury and Deputy State Secretary at the Ministry for National Economy. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. It's a truly privilege to be here and uh, hearing these uh, kind of extraordinary presentations. And I'm very, very glad that uh, Katalin show us uh, the results of uh, our last year's uh, conference, uh, what we financed uh, from the, the, the conference uh, 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 food uh, carbon um, print. And, and that was the idea that more action and not, uh, not just uh, saying so what you saw uh, the last, uh, during the last presentation, uh, that's the result of, of, of the last uh, conferences uh, uh, where we gathered uh, last time. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it's a pleasure to address you with this presentation by the Central Bank of uh, Hungary. The title of my presentation is uh, From Risks to Opportunities Greening the Financial System in Hungary. So let's just uh, spend a couple of thoughts on the issue at uh, hand here, because this is, this is uh, our uh, starting point. The first issue has to do with the physical impacts of climate change. In this regard, some may be surprised that Hungary, a handlock country, is amongst the most vulnerable countries in the EU. This is, you can uh, see on the map on the left side, which exhibits the so-called climate vulnerability index. Hungary's vulnerability stems uh, from the increasing propensity of extreme droughts and its uh, consequences. Uh, when it comes to other environmental hazards, our country ranks the third lowest in terms of total welfare costs to air pollution. These issues alone are enormously important to address. The good news is that uh, at least such physical impacts uh, are relatively well understood. The bad news is that uh, the related economic impacts, which is our area of focus, are much less uh, clear. There is a complex web uh, of interrelations between climate, the environment and uh, the economy and its constituents. Our task today is uh, not to enumerate these. This topic uh, has already a vast literature and deserves a conference on its own. What we would like to illustrate, uh, though, it's the central role of financial institution in this impact chain. Financial institutions uh, are heavily exposed to physical and transition risk through these various channels. This put uh, an enormous responsibility on the central bank's shoulder. This is uh, one of the main reasons why we are here today. The integral role of central banks is to foster the mitigation of the banking sector's sensitivity to transition risks. This always uh, starts with a careful analysis. We estimated the evolution of the transition risk embedded in the Hungarian banking sector's activity by weighting loans and leases by linear and logistic function of the related greenhouse gas intensities of economic subsectors. It is uh, visible that uh, on average the trend was favorable until 2017-2018 
since the gradually increasing amount of outstanding loans finance more and more climate efficient economic activities. This evolution was, however, diverse among uh, banks, an increasing portion of institutions faced increasing risk. Moreover, 2019 was a clear cut outlier. Loans outstanding shifted towards markedly riskier positions. This can be primarily credited to three, four banks, which increased their exposure to a narrow group of major manufacturing companies by leaps and bounds. This is just a snapshot uh, over the last uh, few years. It's uh, unquestionable the transition risk will gain more and more importance in the coming years. So physical and transition risks, the Hungarian Central Bank has recognized these challenges and got into action. In the following, uh, we would like to share with you our own and uh, our partner's achievement uh, so far. To give a framework to our action, in 2019, we launched our green program. The program has three pillars. First, it contains in initiatives for the financial sector. Some of these are related to enhancing the climate risk management capabilities. Other initiates aim at uh, market development, such as facilitating green bond markets and uh, mobilizing funds for green investment. Second, as uh, part of our green program, we engage in domestic and international cooperation to promote green finance and jointly build capacities. And uh, third, the last but equally important pillar is the greening of our own operations. Here we would like to set example by shrinking our own footprint and abide by good disclosure practices. Now uh, we are zooming in on uh, some concrete initiative uh, we implemented, recognizing the lower credit risk of green housing loans, the MMB introduced an unprecedented capital program in 2020. The program operates by a way of granting favorable lending terms for both the banks and the end customers. Namely, in order to participate, lending institutions have to offer at least 30 basis point interest rate discount on green housing loans. In return, the bank uh, gets a preferential capital requirement for those green loans. The theoretical foundations of the program rests on the lower default rates and the better survival prospects of green housing loans. This is uh, depicted in, on the left hand side. This uh, phenomenon stems uh, both from the green value associated with energy efficiency building and also from the lower average overhead cost that results in a higher disposal household incomes. The goal of the capital program are manifold. First of all, it aims uh, to enhance the domestic market development of green financial assets. Secondly, it incentivizes the banks to incorporate climate related risks in their risk assessment models. And finally, it promotes the gathering of uh, energy efficiency data in order to underpin the lower credit risk assumption also on a domestic level. Our mission is not limited to the banking sector. We are actively engaged with the greening of capital markets. In this area, some very important milestones uh, have been reached by our partners. 2020 has witnessed the first Hungarian sovereign bond issuance of 1.5 billion euros. Later, this uh, was matched by the first green corporate issuance as part of the MMB's bond funding for growth scheme. And still in progress, but uh, work has uh, started at the Budapest Stock Exchange to publish an ESG guide for issuers. Similarly, the ESG categorization of uh, Hungarian investment funds is also underway. So we, we are proud of these milestones, but we cannot sit complacent. 
we believe our work has really just uh, started. For 2021, we have set our uh, important goals that we organize in five themes. Uh, in this second part of the presentation, I would like to go over these. So the first theme is about quantifying and managing climate related risks for uh, financial institutions. There are two work areas we would like to highlight here. Uh, we have started the development of a long term climate risk stress test for the Hungarian banking system. Estimating the future evolution of uh, climate risks is far from uh, straightforward. It is not a slightly modified procedure of conventional stress, stress testing. It is rather the elaboration and implementation on, of novel unexploded uh, approaches. However, some uh, properties seem to converge in various frameworks. Our scenarios, which uh, were developed in cooperation with the Cambridge Econometrics, are in line with the conference. We assume there are three different uh, future pathways. There are uh, first an optimistic, somewhat idealistic pathway called the uh, ordinary transition, a bumpier pathway called disordinary transition, and the fair transition pathway uh, that predicts economy, ecologic and uh, economic catastrophe called my, by multiply names, for example, hot house uh, word. Unfortunately, we do not uh, have enough time to delve deeper into these. I invite you to follow our news announcements as the prelim preliminary results are expected next uh, spring. Besides the stress test, we are very advanced with uh, publishing our guidebook on climate related and environmental risk and uh, sustainable banking practices. This document uh, contains uh, recommendations for financial institutions in the subject of uh, risk management, business model and strategy, corporate governance and uh, disclosures. Moving on uh, in our 2021 objectives, a couple of words of our endorsement goals. Since February 2020, MMB is an official supporter of the United Nations uh, Principles for Responsible Banking, which is a great global initiative for commercial banks. We as an endorser institution are encouraging some domestic commercial banks to become signatories and make credible commitments uh, in sustainability. Next, uh, we have a number of initiatives in the pipeline to facilitate uh, green corporate uh, lending. We are planning to extend the green housing loans program to corporate to the corporate sector. A new green corporate capital requirement discount scheme will be rolled out by the end of 2020. The program will first target uh, lending in the renewable energy sector and the purchasing of uh, green bonds. Further expansion of the program is envisaged for non-retail energy efficiency investments, sustainable agriculture and uh, water management. We touched uh, upon milestones in the capital markets in the beginning. So capital markets continues to play a focal point in our green program. Here I would like to highlight uh, an important project supported by the European Commission. A comprehensive project has been launched in cooperation with EBRD and the local consultants. The, the project aims uh, to lay the groundwork for sustainable capital markets in Hungary. Recommendations will, recommendations will pinpoint the changes needed uh, in the regulatory environment and prepare market players for upcoming sustainability regulation. It is uh, envisaged that uh, the project will further facilitate the rollout of uh, green products and uh, create customer awareness. Last but not least, a couple of words on our efforts to reduce our own carbon footprint, as I mentioned to you before. 
As I already mentioned in my opening uh, remarks, we have initiated cooperatives with WWF Hungary to offset uh, our carbon footprint. In 2020, the concept is uh, piloted with the footprint of the 2019 Green Finance Conference. With the MMB funding, uh, WWF uh, will restore a swamp forest area in Western Hungary, taking a large leap forward our 2021 goal is to offset the total footprint of resulting of MMB's whole operation through long-term natural habitat projects. To this end, uh, we will continue to work with the uh, WWF and other partners uh, who would like to join our uh, initiatives. These efforts are coupled with a continuous striving to reduce our own footprint through making our operations resource efficient. We encourage our partners to follow us in these efforts. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, 2020 has been an extremely eventful and challenging year due to the global pandemic. Uh, out of this crisis, short-term objectives have emerged, which uh, often overruled priorities set before this unprecedented upheaval. At the Central Bank of Hungary, we managed to keep combating climate change high on our agenda. We believe that uh, amidst this crisis, some important steps were taken towards greening the financial system in Hungary. And uh, there are many more to follow. We are asking our partners again to join us in this journey. The opportunity, I think, is here. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you, Mr. Kondrac. I would like to ask Sean Kidney to give his presentation. Sean Kidney is CEO of the Climate Bonds Initiative and international NGO, working to mobilize global capital for climate action. He is a member of the European Commission's Platform on Sustainable Finance, as well as a member of Green Finance Committees in China, India, Mexico and Kazakhstan. Sean is also a professor in practice at SOAS, University of London. Um. Ildiko, wouldn't it be fantastic if we all had a central bank like the Hungarian Central Bank? Wouldn't it be fantastic if Magia Hamzeti Bank was everywhere? <laughs> Can I say, Linda, Francesco, I mean, what an exciting presentation. Eh? <laughs> How cool is this? Not to mention this whole conference, but just that last speech. So so thank you, Gabba. That was, that was so cool. So cool. I'm so excited about the opportunities when we have a central bank who understands the risks and understands the opportunities they have to act to address those risks going forward. That's, that's the story of this whole day's conference. So it's fantastic. I mean, we do have some substantial risks as you've heard today. We have the risk of catastrophic climate change if we don't meet the Intergovernmental Panel of Climate Change's 2030 target of global average 55% cut in emissions. Now, Ursula von der Leyen is proposing Europe adopts that target. The European Parliament upped it a little bit a couple of days ago, saying it needed to be 60%. It is very clear that that's a global target, not just the European target, and our challenge in Europe is to not only make sure that we implement these changes and deliver in Europe, which we can and we will do, but to take a leadership role in ensuring that the planet delivers. How can Europe be the turnkey to everywhere else? Well, frankly, we've done a lot of work about that so far, but that's, that's for me the big challenge of the next year, the next 12 months to get things in order. It's not just mitigation. You've heard from Pavan Sukdev and others about what I would call the resilience agenda. Resilience not only means preparing for the climate change we will have. If you avoid catastrophic climate change, we're still going to have a level of climate change, two degrees, possibly two and a half degrees warming, 
will mean the Danube will flood much more often than it is now, and then it'll go into drought in between. That would change our water management infrastructure in Hungary and in Central Europe, for example. We have to prepare for that. That's already part of the green finance story to pick up President Ade's comment at the beginning when he was worried about how much water is part of this. It is already definitely on the agenda. But the pandemic che teaches us that remember that the pandemic can be seen as a climate event. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change's Health Committee has been predicting for 25 years now that we will see a century of pandemics as a result of pathogens jumping between species from degraded environments. And note that Swiss Re issued a report today that said one fifth of all countries are at risk of having their natural ecosystems collapse. The IPCC is saying that collapse leads to pandemics. We can expect to have pandemics on a regular basis in the 21st century. I'm sorry to have to say, because this year has been a brutal year, an absolutely brutal year. Not just loved ones dying or becoming unbelievably sick, but the consequent impact to our economies and to the poor. We're learning the hard way that climate resilience is more than just infrastructure resilience. It needs to encompass health systems. How do we ensure that health systems are prepared for the next crisis that will come as certain as that train comes through Budapest Central every day? There will be another climate crisis. And it'll probably, and a pandemic will be one of the mix that we see. How do we prepare for our economic revival the next time a crisis comes through? Because it will come through. What learnings can we make from this century, can we take from this century of what has worked and what hasn't worked to ensure we're prepared for next time? So there is a big challenge ahead of us on the plus side. We have two things going for us. We have an extraordinary sense, understanding of what the solutions are. Now, in this year, we are learning the hard way about how to respond to pandemics. But when it comes down to mitigation and infrastructure hardening, we know what to do. You can look at the EBRD new policy on climate change that Matteo Romani talked about earlier, and you can see a landscape of what we need to do there. The EU taxonomy work represents a picture of what we have to do, a procurement plan for the Paris Agreement. It is energy, transport, it is also industry. How do we shift to green hydrogen rapidly? It is about things like cement. Did you know, for example, that we have today types of concrete that are 60, 70, sometimes 80% lower emissions than the usual one we use with the same tensile strength and the potentially the same cost? We could shift dramatically and reduce one of the sectors that contributes 5 to 6% of global emissions. You look at each sector in our global economy and you can see pathways to rapid change, steel, plastics, et cetera. We just have to deliver them. And that's the challenging part. Finance is part of it. Finance. Well, we do have to invest about 90 trillion US in the shift to a low carbon and climate resilient economy between now and 2030. But we are unbelievably lucky. As a society, there is now more capital on the planet than ever before in human history. And large slabs of that capital are invested in German bonds. I mean, negative interest rates. How can you pay Linda's pension by investing in a German bond? You can't because it's negative interest. We have to get the money out of those negative and zero interest rate instruments. 21% of institutional investment capital in Europe is in negative or zero interest rate instruments and put it to work. And where will that work come from? It'll come from building back better, building green, building resilient infrastructure. So we are lucky. And that's not just Europe, it's Japan, it's in the US, it's other countries as well. Large pools of capital waiting to be deployed in a way that will ensure our future financial system is less at risk of volatile change than what we're looking at now.
hence the role of the central banks. So that's what excites me about this. I mean, there is some evidence about this. The green bonds market is a proof of concept, if you like. People, if you give them a chance to invest in green, will invest. I mean, look at the Hungarian central bank, as we heard from our previous speaker, 1.5 billion euros issued in June, a fantastic issuance, very successful for Hungary, not to mention the Japanese yen issuance of equivalent to 600 million euros last month. The German Bund got a price benefit. The Dutch green bond, the Netherlands got a price benefit, etc., etc., etc. We have the demand, it is there, we simply need to deliver more product for investors to be able to shift their money in the right direction. Now, what's the agenda look like? Clearly, we have to build back better. You've heard the managing director of the IMF talk about the need to build back better. We have to build what are future-proof investments and abandon the investments that we know are going to degrade. And by the way, we're getting some symbols of this degrade, get degradation underway. Only a couple of weeks ago, the market capitalization of BP was eclipsed by the market capitalization of Orsted, now a, a Danish wind company. This is an extraordinary moment. A couple of days ago, the market capitalization of Exxon was eclipsed by the market capitalization of Next Era, a US renewable energy company. Now, that is because investors believe the future is green. We have won that battle. They are looking for places to shift their money. The market, the, the market cap of green companies tends to be higher now than brown companies, thanks to differential thinking about future returns on investments. We need to make it a jobs-rich recovery. We cannot have, we must not have a recovery that does not, does not put Europeans to work and people around the world. Because if we don't do that, we are at risk of social implosion. We cannot afford large slabs of young people not working as we try and rebuild this economy. So of course, that does mean distributed energy, that does mean environmental restoration, and it means energy efficiency investments, as the Hungarian Central Bank has supported with its risk weighting for green property bonds going forward. So there's an agenda there for governments, which is absolutely critical, and of course, pandemic responses. We need to make it easy for people to know what to do. That is the role of the EU taxonomy. The EU taxonomy is about a shopping list for the future. If it's in the EU taxonomy, it is lower risk. And rec investors are recognizing this. So whenever green bonds are issued, which are in line with the EU taxonomy, they get a, a lower interest rate. Whenever investments are brought to market in the form of green loans or green equity linked to the taxonomy, they get preferential rates. This is already beginning to happen. What the taxonomy is about, fundamentally, is us listening to the scientists like Katal and Zipos. This is a change. For the last 30 years, we have not. We have been saying, look, that's all very well. We know we've got to do that, that but it's very hard. And so when we prioritise green, we're going to go in this direction, which is a mixture of what we think we can do and what needs to be done. That's why we're in this mess where we have to get emissions down 55% in 30 years. The EU taxonomy is different. It is about Europe listening to the scientists first and then looking at how we make these changes going forward. This is the critical change, the critical change of this year. And then finally, we have to drive capital flows. This is what the Hungarian Central Bank's agenda is all about. But it's not just what central banks can do with risk weighting, what green quantitative easing, as Christine Lagarde has been talking about, with the disclosure regulation that the European Commission is bringing in, which is going to drive a race to sustainability amongst all investors, corporations and banks in Europe. These are critical steps. But it's also about how we make sure our public capital is preferenced actively towards green. 
the EBRD strategy of 50% lending to have green going forward is a critical example of this. The European Investment Bank has the same target. Lower cost preferential capital focused on our public policy objectives is what this is about. Of course, the Recovery and Resilience Fund is part of this, with a third of the investments going towards green investments. But something people forget about is the other two thirds of the 750 billion euros of grant and loans has to also address resilience factors. So as a member state, when you're applying for that money, you need to be thinking about how the investments you make will support resilience in the European economy, in your economy specifically. Don't remember that. That picks up that resilience agenda we spoke about before. Now, finally, there is an important job for governments to, in their Building Back Better agenda. They knew, do need to be thinking about real economy strategies. What are building regulations going to look like in the next five years? Guys, they have to change. They have to be tougher. We need to go from uh, a situation where we're having open slather to a situation where not only do we ban incandescent light bulbs, as we have already done in Europe some years ago, but we ban bad practices when it comes to energy efficiency. We need industrial strategies that preference green hydrogen as a supply for our industry to allow our steel industry, our plastics industry, and so on to shift to a sustainable footing. We need water infrastructure planning that will deal with the climate change we know is coming, come what may. Hungary, Central European countries are at risk here, physically, environmentally. We have to take action on ensuring we build the right kind of infrastructure. There is a role for governments to create the investments that investors want to put their money into. And that is the big opportunity for governments going forward. Look, the taxonomy is important, not just because it's doing mitigation and transition and adaptation, but because it, we, as a member of the EU platform, will be looking at resilience investments this coming year. What do they involve? How do we work out the right things to do, given the learnings of this year and the past couple of years? Central bank's policy, I have to say, is critically important. And I'm putting this slide up because I'm so excited to be part of this event, with this event, with a central bank that is taking a forthright activist leadership policy in a way that every central bank in Europe needs to, let alone every central bank in the world. There are, of course, many things we would suggest the Hungarian Central Bank can do beyond what it's already doing. All I know is it has started. It has brought in measures already, and that has to be cheered. That has to be a fantastic thing to feel proud of. So thank you. This year, we have an air of possibility. This year, through the crucible of crisis, through the brutal lessons of the pandemic, there is one thing we do have, a sense that we can change and we can change quickly. We have to seize that, seize that moment, seize that opportunity, knowing that capital wants to move. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Kidney. I invite Gurbus Gonul to give his presentation. Mr. Gonul is director for Country Engagement and Partnership of the International Renewable Energy Agency, or IRENA, in short. IRENA is an intergovernmental organization supporting countries in their transition to a sustainable energy future. Good was Thank the floor. <laughs> Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, greetings from Abu Dhabi. Um, where our headquarters are located, and thank you for this opportunity to speak uh, in this um, um, very interesting event uh, today. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, the ongoing pandemic continues to affect lives and livelihoods across the globe with far-reaching economic and social impacts. And uh, governments are mobilizing unprecedented level, um, um, very significant funds to stimulate the economy, and how we choose to spend this money will profoundly affect uh, the future generations. It is imperative that we align the short-term economic downturn 
with the medium term and long term needs of sustainable development and the Paris Agreement on climate change. Um, IRENA is the lead intergovernmental organization supporting its 161 members and some um, 20, I think it's, uh, today it's 22 states in accession. And we support them in their energy transition. And in that context, we have analyzed the role of energy um, within energy transition and published the, the post-COVID recovery an agenda for res resilience, development, and equality. A, a, a report looking into the uh, post-COVID uh, recovery uh, and connecting it with the uh, energy transition. What makes our work coherent and distinct um, is that uh, the recovery options I will outline today are based on IRENA's long-term pathway towards 1.5 degree future. So we have uh, worked backwards from the future and uh, the Global Renewables Outlook report that we have launched uh, back in April presents a Paris compliant path with, uh, with which uh, current and future energy investments should align. Uh, we did not look at uh, energy in isolation, but see the energy transition as a means to meet multiple social, um, economic and environmental priorities. We especially focused on investments that can help us kickstart our economies and create much needed jobs while ensuring um, a climate uh, safe future for our children. Um, the, um, let me first outline um, what is necessary in the short term. We estimate that two trillion US dollars of energy transformation investment is needed each year in the recovery phase between 2021 and 2023. This is more than double the 825 billion US dollars invested in renewable energy and other renewable energy technologies um, in uh, 2019. And this constitutes a total of six trillion US dollars, with half of the funds for efficiency and the other half um, distributed between renewable energy, electrification, especially of end use sectors such as um, electromobility, heat pumps, etc., and but also um, uh, electricity infrastructure and grid. Um, we also see a key role for investments to support innovation. For example, the green hydrogen economy or new industrial processes. And we should always remember that um, um, it is critical to ensure the long-term success of the transition. And uh, that's why uh, we should not forget um, um, looking into innovation as a key element of our um, transformation. Um, this increase in the speed of energy transition brings, brings immediate effect, especially on job creation. And this, especially given the current context where much needed boost is needed in, in, in jobs in these times of economic uncertainty. IRENA is the authority on the socioeconomic of uh, energy transformation. And we regularly look into the economic impact of, um, of, um, of uh, energy transition, socioeconomic impact. And in the last seven years, we tracked uh, job creation effect of it. Um, in that time, jobs uh, have doubled to over 11 million in the last seven years that we have uh, been looking into the job creation impact of energy transition. By 2023, the investment we have outlined, we um, will create an additional 5.5 million jobs. And each million dollar investment, uh, investment made will create 25 jobs in renewables. The same investment will create 10 jobs in energy efficiency. And also socioeconomic benefits will, um, would already accrue in the first three years of recovery programs while simultaneously accelerating uh, the needed energy transition. Indeed, um, recovery investment linked to the energy transition would boost um, GDP by an additional 1% per year on average. And we believe this is, uh, uh, we believe this to be a very critical aspect and very compelling argument for placing energy transformation at the heart of uh, economic uh, recovery. And um, to have a rational and impactful recovery strategy that makes economic sense, there must be a medium outlook. That's why we have um, extended the, um, the, um, the analysis to 2030 and, um, and 
then we place the stimulus within the 10 year span uh, to, to both make it more practical and realistic. Also, not to miss um, opportunities in industrial development or innovation that require political choice and related measures. By 2030, over half of the world's power generation can be sourced from renewables. That's five times more than current plants indicate. But ramping up uh, like this means substantial upfront spending, as well as re-evaluating the cost of, uh, sorry, cost effectiveness of existing assets. The investment that starts now must continue. Cumulatively, total energy transformation investment would, um, would be close to 50 trillion US dollars between now and 2030. Um, but this investment pays off. Uh, jobs in renewables can grow to some 30 million um, uh, jobs in 2030, almost three times the levels of 2018. The transforming energy scenario that we have developed has consistently positive effect compared to the plant energy scenario. Plant energy scenario is based on the existing plants and, and, and uh, priorities of, of governments. And that will boost um, global GDP by an additional average 1.3% um, per year between 2020 and 2030. The cumulative GDP gain would therefore amount to around uh, 16 trillion um, uh, US dollars. The, um, the policymakers need to recognize how many renewable energy jobs can be created along each segment of the value chain. So they can design green recovery programs that would maximize regional and national uh, value creation. If you look at different regions in Europe, uh, we calculate that an accelerated energy transition would create around 300,000 um, more jobs in Eastern Europe, 100,000 jobs in Southern Europe, and 1.5 million um, jobs across the EU by 2030. This is on the top of the jobs that will be created um, under already existing plans. So these are all, all um, the um, additional jobs that we are um, expecting to be uh, created. And the next decade um, will be decisive for our efforts to shape more sustainable and resilient economies and societies. And here um, I would like to take this opportunity to zoom in a bit more in this region. Um, based on um, uh, findings from IRENA's roadmap study uh, for Central and uh, Southeastern Europe um, energy connectivity, which is SESEC uh, region, which we released the um, released uh, this, this report um, last week, in fact, uh, at the SESEC uh, ministerial. The SESEC area has an excellent conditions for renewable energy technologies, and in IRENA's assessment, renewables can grow uh, cost effectively to deliver more than one third of the energy consumption of the region by uh, 2030. Um, country specific economic potential would uh, support overall renewable share uh, ranging from 23% to 56% and harnessing this potential will have a variety of, um, um, of uh, benefits. Sorry. And, uh, Here. Um, the first, um, there will be a significant cost savings. Um, most of the renewable options considered in the roadmap um, deliver savings um, compared to um, conventional technologies and would total um, uh, 3.5 billion uh, euro per year by 2030. If you take into consideration the externalities um, from avoided health and environmental damages, this increases to between 11 to 35 million US dollars per year. And um, then um, secondly, um, it would improve energy security. The region is highly dependent on fossil fuels and has been exposed to cuts in natural gas supplies. And finally, it would increase uh, resilience to external disruptions while also aligning the region with the goals of the Paris Agreement and providing significant economic and uh, social benefits uh, as mentioned. Um, and in order to achieve um, 
the the goals that we had that I have uh, mentioned about uh, the SESEC members will need to scale up investments over the coming decade. And this will be the case um, in any event as a large part of existing fossil fuel assets um, uh, are due for retirement in the next 10 years, um, which is also an opportunity to invest in uh, modern, affordable and climate safe energy systems and also to avoid um, uh, stranded assets. In our roadmap, uh, SESEC members would need an additional 78 um, billion cumulative um, uh, uh, euro until 2030, a 26 percent increase compared to um, what is planned. And um, let me also um, briefly mention about the climate investment platform because that is um, um, one of the initiatives that IRENA has developed with the partners in order to support investments um, in energy transition. Um, because the, the current uh, global level of investments are not sufficient to realize these benefits. And to change this, we need definitely a more concrete action by everyone. And this climate investment platform, we have developed it together with uh, UNDP uh, and Sustainable Energy for All. We are in cooperation with Gl uh, Green Climate Fund, and that was last um, launched um, um, back in uh, 2019, um, the 2018, in fact, uh, during the climate um, um, summit. The overall purpose of the summit is to bring together governments, um, financial communities, development partners, private sector, the industry, uh, to boost investments in renewable energy projects. And how are we going to do that? Um, on the one side, we are trying to help project proposals, um, to improve the project proposals, to bring them to a potential bankability, um, but also how we can facilitate access to finance and provide um, uh, very risking solutions. Um, we intend to organize the so-called investment forums in uh, 14 uh, different uh, regions. One of them is in, in Southeast Europe, in fact. And um, in those forums, we want to bring together, um, on the one hand, um, uh, both investors and governments to have an enhanced dialogue on, on how to improve the investment climate uh, and how to uh, what needs to be done in order to um, make um, environment more conducive to um, renewable energy investments. And on the other hand, um, we, we want to organize specific matchmaking events for those projects that we helped to bring to bankability and also those identified partners we have. Some of them are listed on the uh, screen uh, here. And we identified those partners for each and every um, uh, geographic cluster and try to have a matchmaking between good projects and all the in interested uh, investors and, and financiers. Thank you very much. Um, I'm looking forward to discussion. Thank you, Mr. Gonova. Again, let us do a survey with you. If somebody is watching the stream in full screen mode, please switch to normal mode by voting. The question is, does the COVID-19 crisis rather accelerate or slow down the transition to a sustainable economy in Central Europe? A accelerates or B slows down. Please submit your vote now. And the result is A. It appears that the majority thinks that the COVID crisis is accelerating the transition to sustain sustainability. We continue today's event with the second panel discussion, which is also moderated by Linda Zeilina. Linda, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, and thank you to all our speakers for some great presentations, inserting some good energy. And in light of that poll, 
that shows that people do believe that this might be a bit of a turning point for the region. Um, I think it's only uh, fitting that we actually talk about what does it take to tackle the social and environmental externalities that the markets aren't currently priced in. I believe some of you already touched upon the fact that at the moment these these particular aspects market doesn't price in and that is a problem. So in the light of COVID-19, what are the most overlooked or potentially underused opportunities to ensure that when we build back, we do build back in a more sustainable and resilient way? And what particular opportunities do you see in the Central European region? So if we would um, start with Deputy Governor Kondrac, and then we will proceed. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh... Why well, not directly connected to the COVID-19, but uh, I think the greatest green growth opportunities uh, in Hungary is connected to the property sector and uh, within the property sector, the residential properties, because here in Hungary, the, the households, uh, the flats uh, uh, quality in uh, in terms of uh, energy efficiency point of view it's it's quite low and there is a huge uh, room to to improve that and uh, uh, i think this is a it could be a, a potential win-win situation both uh, from the climate side because uh, you know better uh, house means uh, uh, better uh, quality it means uh, less co2 emission and of course, it means uh, that people can uh, hold more money uh, to spend it uh, to other way. And, um, and that's also uh, win to the economy because uh, a situation like uh, that, uh, everybody seeks the opportunities how to maintain or facilitate uh, the, the economic growth. And, and uh, uh, these kind of uh, uh, things like uh, like a, 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 a large scale innovation program uh, could could uh, help uh, to to the economy and to the climate uh, also. So that's why we try to help uh, the the government to create uh, uh, 50 points uh, how to handle uh, the the COVID, uh, what uh, the the government uh, needs to do, and one major part of that uh, is a is a large scale renovation program i think this is a this is a, a hidden opportunity right now in in hungary and and we have to use it thank you yes uh, it's definitely a very promising development in hungary we are watching them closely and they are very inspirational so hopefully that will serve to inspire other governments in the region um Gerbus, would you like to add anything? Have you seen any particularly promising opportunities that COVID has created in this space? All right, thank you very much. In fact, I mean, this is also a bit uh, independent from COVID, but uh, that's my one of my observations in the region um, is that um, I think there are lots of opportunities um, that has not been um, tapped full extent is the potential uh, for renewable heating systems. I think I'm talking about biomass, I'm talking about geothermal, I'm talking about solar thermal, I'm talking about um, electrification of district heating systems. And there are two um, major issues. One is um, at the policy level, policy makers level, there is not enough attention um, in many countries. Uh, but also there are not um, sufficiently or well-designed um, financial incentives because this is um, one of the areas that um, in order to mobilize investment, you will need um, uh, financial in incentives to use wisely the public money um, to uh, mobilize investments. And, um, and this has not been done properly so far. I think, of course, there are a lot of options in, in front of you for policy makers introducing um, energy quotas and mandates for uh, centralized heating, for district heating um, and uh, systems, for instance, or decentralized solutions like heat pumps, 
Um, also, when we talk about financial incentives um, or grants or tax credits to subsidize uh, the higher capital costs for um, renewable heat options in buildings uh, as well as in um, uh, industry, I think these are uh, some of the options that can be considered. IRENA has recently developed um, um, a guidelines. Um, and in those guidelines, we try to inform policymakers in, in viable options of using low temperature uh, renewable energy, including geothermal, in district heating systems. And this is based on base, best practices across the globe and try to raise awareness around it and uh, around that and, and try to um, help governments to seriously con consider and bring them into their uh, national planning processes, these options also. Fantastic, thank you. So we've got now retrofitting in the building sector, we've got the heating systems, so there are opportunities certainly there. So Sean, um, what do you believe are the main constraints that currently prevent this shift towards uh, opportunities and financing these opportunities that do exist? And how could we attract more private capital to finance the transition in the region? Well, remember that we've proven that we can attract capital already. That's what the Hungarian sovereign issuance shows in terms of green bonds and we and the support that we're now seeing from the EBRD and the EIB shows that we can do this. The question is, where do we, you know, what are the qualifying investments? B buildings, clearly, I mean, that's a quarter of emissions in most Central European countries. And I think the Wuppertal Institute in a report a few years ago now reckon that Europe could probably meet its emissions reduction targets just of a massive building-related energy efficiency program in Eastern Europe. Hey, let's take advantage of these guys. Let's lower the energy bills for citizens in across Eastern Europe and get capital flowing in and create jobs because this will create jobs. Building construction industry is what gets people working fast. So that's clearly one, but there is more. Every economy needs to look at its exports and its imports, but its exports in particular. To take Hungary, for example, where 50% of exports in the auto industry. This is an industry about to go massive radical reconstruction. There is a risk that Hungary will be frozen out and be kept of legacy sectors while Volkswagen and David LeBenz build their electric plants somewhere else. The government needs to be on top of this because otherwise we're going to lose a lot of jobs in Hungary. And this applies to every country around Eastern Europe. Think about what the industrial transitions that are coming our way are. The EU taxonomy gives you an example of where the transitions will occur. And then think about what is your proactive industrial policy to ensure you can get a bite of the future industries to replace the industries that will transition and will change. And I think this is a really critically important thing. The measures are fairly straightforward. I mean, clearly there's industrial transition strategy in each country that needs to be looked at. Um, this is a government responsibility. We have not looked at enough in terms of where the industries will be in the future. We've been stuck in legacy thinking, how to protect old industries. That has to change. That is being swept away right now. Um, we need to be looking at the economic opportunities that arise out of that understanding looking forward in things like auto, electric vehicles, cement, hydrogen, water infrastructure. What have we got in Romania to be able to be an economic advantage going forward? How can we plan accordingly? Because the world is going to change very quickly. And not just because Europe, because China is acting pronto, pronto, pronto. We've got the other tools. Clearly, central bank policy is a really important part of this. Understanding what we need to do to ensure financial stability going forward to minimise the risk of disruption from failed loans, which we're going to see a lot of in this transition that we're going through. But there is much more that we can do to simply allocate capital. The Recovery and Resilience Fund is one of those things. Let's make it work for us. Let's actually use that capital, the grant capital, as well as the, as well as the very low cost loan capital to shift those industries and let's get the EBRD in and signing checks. Guys, Matteo, where are you? Sign some checks for green things now. We're ready. We're ready to earn. So all the tools are there. We just need to move super fast in identifying the investments and that will require a government analysis of how our economy needs to work in the future. 
Fantastic, Sean. Thank you. It is a shame that Mattia isn't here to uh, respond to that, but uh, <laughs> I'm sure he's going to see some of this uh, later. So you actually bring us to a very important and interesting question. There has been a very active debate between what is the role of the government versus the central bank? What are the limitations of monetary or fiscal policy? So since all these government responses um, that have been very proactive will result in inevitable increases in government, de government debt. Um, that might actually leave a lot less fiscal space going forward, or at least create a bit of discussion around what can we afford and what can't we afford um, in the future. So going forward, should central banks be playing a more active role in promoting structural transformation of economy or finance? Is there a bigger role for monetary policy going forward? And what are the potential limitations that um, that central banks face? And of course, the person best placed to answer this question, or at least start uh, going at it, is Deputy Governor Kandraj. So the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, indeed, the, the rising government debt uh, levels uh, that it's, it's, it's truly a barrier could be in a situation where, where we have to invest and, 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 and put more and more money to, to this uh, field, which, which uh, means the, the climate agenda. And yeah, this is, it, it looks a little bit uh, controversial how we can do this right now, because maybe the, the focus uh, has driven away uh, to the stakeholders uh, 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 from the green agenda to the, the to address the the burning problems, give liquidity to the markets, uh, uh, then then uh, try to handle the what what the the uh, asset quality uh, deterioration would mean and so on and so on and and but here is the climate uh, issue also so. It's absolutely a, a, a very uh, uh, challengeable situation right now. But I think uh, we, we, if, if we see a complex situation like that, we try to find out very uh, simple answers. And, and for instance, and, and we mentioned it uh, before, that, that if you are saying that that every country, every institution, every personal have a, a responsibility uh, to 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 have to shift uh, our life uh, to a, a climate friendly uh, new uh, normality. I think first everybody has to focus on their own operation, and this is very simple. I think so. It's not just the government question. It's not just the central bank question. It's it's it every institution, every market players and individual uh, role to to move towards a greener uh, normality, a new uh, life, which which helps, which facilitate the the green uh, agenda. And uh, fortunately or unfortunately, it depends. But this is this is the right moment because. Uh, due to the COVID-19 situation, now our everyday life totally changed. And now we are going on a, a, new, a new normality and it's easier to, to do this shift hand-to-hand uh, -hand, uh, with the green idea than, than, than just wait and, and, and see what will happen. So I think my, my first uh, argument that, that uh, of course, Government is it's a key player, uh, but but we we have to focus on the bottom up uh, approach also, and and let's see what we can do uh, in in our private life and and as a as an institution, and of course awaiting the help uh, from the government also, and uh, going to the central banks. I think uh, uh, if it, this is a fair argument, what I told you right now. Uh, every central bank uh, has the opportunity to look around and see and evaluate their their tool set, what they have. Of course, uh, central banks who 
whose responsibility also the supervision of, of, of the financial institution, I think uh, has a wider tool set to, to uh, contribute the, not just the, the uh, pre-COVID uh, situation, but, but the green agenda also. And, and uh, that's uh, what we are doing uh, here in Hungary. So, so try to focus on our own operation, uh, try to reach the net zero emission. Then uh, we check the, what, what is the supervisory uh, tool set. So that's why we, we launched the uh, uh, capital uh, uh, initiatives to, to emphasize uh, the banks to finance more and more green uh, industry. But of course, uh, as a central bank, we, we also contribute uh, the 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 green green uh, purchase program and 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 uh, these uh, kind of things so let's gather what kind of tools we have mix it a little bit and 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 see it as a as a holistic approach and and try to find a good solution i think every central bank has uh, opportunities to 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 facilitate the the green agenda Fantastic. And that's a very powerful message, suggesting that we should all take a step back and have a think in terms of how does climate change and sustainability actually affect our jobs and our ability to perform as professionals, because it's not just the sustainability department's job to think about it. It's all of ours. And, um, and a bit of creativity sparkled on top is might actually lead to some exciting things. Um, so, Sean, what is your opinion about um, about the di discussion between fiscal versus monetary policy, and what do you see as um, as a potential outcome going forward from these discussions? Um, and where are the the little opportunities that we could exploit, maybe more or better? Well, if we're to achieve the change, we we must achieve. Let's be clear about this to have any kind of reasonable future for our children. We need everyone, we need everyone. One party cannot achieve this change alone. So collaboration amongst all the parties involved, which will include the policy makers of government, will include the regulators, will include investors and banks, and a local and multinational, et cetera, is going to be necessary and will become a feature of the coming 10 years. This is unusual in history. But remember, we are talking about a dramatic and rapid change in our economies to be able to achieve this transition. So this is necessary. However, I don't want to underplay, I want to stress, in fact, the critical intellectual leadership of central banks. In the world we have created, we have put central banks on a pedestal. Now, I appreciate, Mr. Kondrax, you might not feel like that on a day-to-day -day basis, but we have said, that central banks have a leadership role in ensuring financial stability. So when central banks act and their intellectual framework changes, the world listens. So do not underestimate this intellectual leadership role of our central banks, of the central bank in Hungary, begin to talk about this and begin to say, we need to act, this is what the future needs to look like. That is unbelievably powerful. You have a convening role, which others do not have. Now, exactly what's done at that convening role, where we go, can become a further conversation. But let's be clear about that. In terms of what we do do, in terms of the toolkit, where we should be looking is Majun. Dr. Majun's speech this morning, which I know we're good friends now, I've heard him speak many times, sums up the wide range of things you can do if you do take an activist role. We have been hobbled in Europe. We have been hobbled by this idea that we have to maintain a level playing field and then make changes. The playing field is tilted so much to brown already that realistically we've got it tilted to green until we stabilize the environment. That's a conceptual shift there. The Chinese understand this. So PBOC has been very attractive, very aggressive in the measures it's taken, both as incentives, you've heard liquidity lending window discounts, for example, to guidelines to promoting innovation incentives around different provinces around China. Now we can learn from that because they're doing a test bed, they're doing a laboratory for us all. 
what works and what doesn't work, and we should implement. We made a mistake in the last couple of years in Europe, which I think is changing, which is we thought we can't afford to adjust this level playing field, and we have to make sure that everything is couched in the question of asset risk. Let's take the risk weighting issue. By not shifting our urban environment to green, we are creating major risks for the forward stability of our economy. So waiting for a risk argument as to why energy efficient properties need to be biased is kind of like putting the cart before the horse. From a public policy objective, addressing climate change and reducing forward risk has to be the dominant idea in all our institutions going forward. And looking for quick and rapid ways to shift are critical. I don't know whether the risk weighting will work, by the way. Obviously, the Hungarian Central Bank is a kind of test program. But the main point is we need to start trying things rather than waiting for evidence-based reasons to try and fix up the future. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. As if we're ever going to get a really solid evidence-based past data set to be able to determine how we reduce risk in the future. And that's what we can learn from the scenario planning that NGFS, Network Green Financial System, has done. And in, as we start to apply that, we need to be thinking about the critical issue is starting to reduce risk, come what may. And if we don't have the data, we cannot stay frozen by the headlights. That's why I'm so pleased to be here, because I'm in the company of a central bank that wants to act. So, hallelujah. <laughs> Thank you, Sean. Um, indeed, I mean, in light of that um, previous poll for the previous session where it showed that the audience believed that the companies and businesses in this in this region, wider region, don't necessarily think about sustainability and sustainable um, finance and the risks associated, I think this is a very powerful message that um, we do need to be tilting these weights and having a think, how does actually long-term value creation and retention happen? Is that going to change going forward? Um, Gerbers, do you have anything to add? Um, I don't think we can hear you, so just double check that the microphone is muted. So, apologies, I think it wasn't. Perfect. <laughs> On. Um, just building on um, what um, um, Sean was saying. In fact, I mean, when you look at the renewables and how and, and, play, and creating a level um, playing field for it. In fact, when we look at the cost of solar and wind, they are competed, competitive with all other alternatives. Today, building or investing in solar and wind is cheaper than running existing. Um, coal power plants, but if only a level playing field is created. And today it doesn't exist in most places. I think that is one of the uh, things that we need to look into. We are talking about we have cheap, abundant solar and wind and how we can integrate it into the systems. Um, but on the other hand, um, how we can, on the, okay, there is also the techn techni technical side that how we can ensure the system uh, reliability, but on the other, uh, but uh, most importantly, how we can create an, um, an, an, a competitive, real, a genuine uh, competitive environment between uh, renewables and their um, competitors, uh, comp uh, competing um, uh, alternatives. Um, and um, for electrification, uh, especially for the electricity sector, I think obviously it is important to, to uh, plan it well and, um, and create the right enabling environment. But when you're planning for renewables, I think it's important to, to um, take into consideration the future electrification of end use sectors. I mentioned a bit about heating, but it's also about uh, uh, transport sector. It's also about industry sector. It's about e-mobility, and it is it is picking up so fast in many markets now, and um, and this will obviously put um, uh, pressure on uh, electrification system. So you need to design your electrification. I think design. I mean, investing in renewables and then designing is not an option. You have to design first and then invest for renewables. I mean, you need to 
be able to accommodate the entire power you uh, generate through renewables and design your system flexibly because the key word is flexibility how to design flexible systems it's not about how to have um, or try to ensure flexible um, uh, supply source it's the entire system flexibility we are talking about it is at the generation um, um, level it is at the consumption level it is at the uh, entire value chain uh, through the uh, uh, power system i think these are um, some of the key um, elements that we need to take into consideration. Absolutely fantastic. Uh, I couldn't agree more that it's very important to design first and then invest um, rather than vice versa and then deal with the unintended consequences and potential trade-offs. Um, so that brings to another important topic that is um, that has been um, discussed in the region. So we have the EU's recovery and resilience plans, we have the EU's Green Deal. So greening is coming to Europe and Central Europe is an absolutely crucial part of Europe. It's, um, we can argue like some people do when it comes to Brexit that, you know, we're not part of Europe, but hey, we are, we are in the same geographic block. And these, some of these issues are really cross-border issues that you can't tackle on your own. So, in your view, does the, do the EU's plans present a good opportunity for the region? Uh, in your opinion, are there any shortcomings of what is currently discussed in terms of the financing? What could the stakeholders improve when it comes to EIB, when it comes to other uh, big actors in the space? what would you like to see happening in the next year or two in terms of investments and assistance to the region? So again, let's start with Deputy Governor Kandraj. Very excited to hear what, what you think. Thank you very much. Uh, I think, yeah, the EU uh, Green Deal will hopefully is a good basis. Uh, but uh, I think uh, it, it, it's a good starting point and every country uh, has to build on their strategy on, on, on this basis. And, and uh, if we do that, I think we would uh, get a, a holistic uh, big picture. Because uh, what is, I think, uh, uh, one uh, major shortcoming in, in our mindset, and, and, and Sean mentioned that one of our key uh, uh, role could be that as a central bank that we try to change it uh, uh, this uh, mindset and 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 try to reach that that the green idea would be uh, 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 an everyday uh, uh, thing if 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 we if we are working on our everyday uh, uh, job and and here is a, a little shortcoming in my point of view that that I think. Uh, uh, the, the the companies or central banks or or, 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 or countries focus on in their strategy uh, in a in a two five years horizon and uh, next to it there is a, a, a green uh, strategy also and somehow we we should uh, reach that uh, that these two would be one and uh, and if we focus on uh, our uh, two five or ten years uh, strategy or we create it, uh, we should put in to the mega trends on, on, on this uh, strategy. And one of that is this, uh, this uh, climate issue. And, and if we do this, I think uh, we, we very, very uh, uh, fastly would, would uh, reach the point when, when we would realize that, okay, we have as a country uh, a strategical approach, but without our partners it's it's uh, it's not uh, not so useful for instance uh, one uh, one uh, concrete example uh, which uh, connected to hungary the water management so so of course we can create and it's it's needed to create a, a, a water uh, management uh, a sustainable water plan a sustainable water strategy uh, just in Hungary, but but uh, it's it would be better uh, if we create it with our neighbors, and we can overlap not just uh, 
our country, but, uh, but the, the whole region also. And, uh, and if we can uh, reach this and, uh, and work together, I, I'm pretty sure that we can, we can uh, find uh, better uh, solutions. And, and, and another example, the renewable energy production also. So if we can not just uh, stop uh, in, in the borders, but try to uh, uh, think a little bit uh, wider and, and try to think uh, uh, as a region, I think uh, we can easier can can uh, can uh, reach our goals and so uh, overall EU Green Deal I think that's a that's a very very good basis uh, and we have to use it uh, not just as a country but as a region as a as a as a community also. Fantastic, thank you. I do like the more regional lens because I do think that. Uh, in a region, we really can create a larger economy of scale. Um, Gerbers, that brings me to you. So in the region currently, um, if you look at the overall um, percentage of uh, renewable energy sources that are contributing to the energy mix, they're not very high. Of course, there's some variation between the countries. So what do you think would actually help speed up the transition to, renew to renewable power generation? Um, what would help this um, this shift towards green? Do you think it's market integration, switching to prosumers, or what? What do you believe would be the most promising and most um, like the best way to go forward? Thank you. Um, I think, as you mentioned, that it, market indirect integration is one of the key words. I think um, both for Central Europe, but also Southeastern Europe, there are great opportunities and benefits um, for um, um, integrating Martex because of the nature of uh, some of the renewable energy technologies. Uh, they can benefit from, uh, from um, this um, connections that can provide the flexibility um, in the systems uh, that we can integrate larger sums of renewables into, um, um, into the grid. I think that is the first aspect. Second aspect is that, and what are the stumbling blocks um, for integrating more renewables. I mentioned about the, I think, um, the, um, uh, the low cost of renewables and how to integrate it into the systems. I think in that context, I think the um, 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 innovation in um, increasing market flexibility, sorry, not market, but system flexibility for renewables to penetrate more, I think it's key. And when I'm talking about innovation, innovation is not only about technology. Obviously, there are a lot of technology related aspects, but it is also about the market design. It is also about how you operate your system in an optimized way. It is also about what sort of business schemes that you are developing. So it should be an, um, um, an, a balanced um, uh, mix of different options that you have under different, these four different pillars. And obviously that will differ from one country to another based on their priorities and based on the givens in that particular market. That's why I think uh, it's very important to uh, identify right mix for your own country so that this uh, integration can be facilitated. And the other issue is, I think, uh, definitely the, um, the finance issue. I think this has been discussed. The money is there, but why is not uh, flowing and whether there, is, um, um, there are certain issues that investors don't feel confident to invest in markets. Obviously, in some of the markets that we have looked in, in um, Central and Southern Europe, um, this one of the issues is um, cost of capital. And how to reduce the cost of capital is at the end of the day, how investors perceive risks in that particular market and how these risks, even that the perceived risks can be uh, eliminated. Um, I think um, obviously there is a lot about the creating the um, right policy and regulatory environment, giving right signals to the investors, long-term signals and policy um, assurance to uh, investors, but also addressing those specific particular aspects that uh, directly relevance to the investors' um, um, invest, in investment decisions, like um, I mean, I mean, how to connect to the grid, um, or uh, what do we do if I have a surplus of uh, electricity, um, etc. So these all nitty-gritty details of the um, investment environment should be sorted out. 
Okay, great. Thank you. I mean, some very, very strong and valid points there of how to go forward and what would really help. Um, couldn't agree more. So, Sean, uh, green bonds do present quite a good opportunity for, for a variety of actors to act in this space. So, what do you believe would help to create a greater uptake of green bond issuance? We have been in conversation with a lot of uh, municipalities and authorities across the region and actually the interest in is potentially issuing them um, because of EU's green shift is considerable. However, it seems that there is a lack of capacity or knowledge to actually go forward and structure such deals. So what are your thoughts and what do you believe would really help scale up the green bond issuance in the region? We need a couple of levels of technical assistance or capacity building. At one very basic level, there's the issue of simply how do you take advantage of the trends already in the market, such as green bonds, green loans, etc. And Linda, I hope to work with you on this in the future. <laughs> Let's see if we can find a way to craft a program in Central Europe. That's one. We are definitely and, up for that. <laughs> and, and we know that people like EBRD and DG Reform are already looking at how they can support that kind of process going forward. So that's good news. The more substantial thing, though, and picking up what Gubas and uh, said, is around regional planning. You know, we need to be starting to think about ourselves as integrated economies because we are integrated economies. I mean, just look at Hungary's export profile. 26% going to Germany. What Germany decides affects the Hungarian economy. Is there a voice? No. So we need that voice about how we plan our regional economies. Now, this is also, by the way, critical to the future of Europe, because if Europe is going to achieve its potential as a global soft power, as a leader of the transition that will happen in the next 10 years, it needs to act in concert. Now, that means economic opportunity planning. As we think of what the next 10 years is going to bring, we've got to be prepared as a region to work together to grasp those opportunities and build our economies through that process. We need to look beyond the economic opportunities in industry to also the defensive opportunities. I mean, clearly, if you want to look at how we have to manage water systems in Central Europe, to ensure that we're not going to be impacted by major climate impact, which is going to happen. We're not going to just do this in Budapest or Bucharest. We have to work together. So regional environmental planning is a critical part of how we go forward. And in the lessons of regional environmental planning, we're going to learn a whole lot of things which we can export, which we can take to countries around the world who are just beginning to think about how to manage that economic way. We can create new industries through adaptation and resilience activities. And this is what we have to do. We cannot do it as individual member states. None of us has an economy large enough. To be honest, even Germany doesn't really have, but it might take a while before they realise that. The European Commission can be our vehicle to ensure that we come together in regional economic and regional environment and regional energy planning, as Gubbers was talking about and start to shift these economies fast and create business opportunities for us all as we go forward and job opportunities, right? We have to create jobs here and then we have to help Sub-Saharan Africa, South Asia make the transition in rapid time. We can use European technology and learning and European capital. We can export that capital with clever instruments like green bonds, but many others as well, and become a wholesale supplier to the financing that the emerging markets need. 70% of what we invest in in the next 30 years will be in emerging markets. We can be the leader. So that's what I'd say. Come together, get the commission in the room to help us do this regional building, this capacity development, but think as Europe now. That's the future. Thank you, Sean. That's exactly. Exactly. Perfect ending to our session, reminding us all not to lose the sight of the bigger picture because we are all dependent on each other to one extent or another. 
And indeed, uh, Europe has a great advantage here. It's been on this treadmill running, doing greening, doing all sorts of technologies, thinking about this much longer than any other region. So in that sense, that is our competitive advantage that we can then do some knowledge brokering and potentially invest in things that are long term sustainable because finance should not be unsustainable. Just the fact of that is just a bit shocking if you think about the language there. You should be thinking not about organic carrots, but you should be thinking about what is in those non-organic carrots, pesticide carrots, nobody likes that. So in the same vein, finance should be sustainable, all of it should be, and we do believe that this region has some great potential for growth, for development, for prosperity for everyone. And that's why at the ISFC we will be making sure that this region gets heard in international debates and national and regional debates and that we push forward for a green transition that works for everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Linda and all the panel participants. Ladies and gentlemen, we will have a lunch break now. We will continue the conference at 2 p.m. with the third panel discussion about green bonds in Central Europe.
Ladies and gentlemen, before we continue our conference with the third panel discussion, let us have an, an our final vote. If somebody is watching the stream in full screen mode, please switch to normal mode while voting. The question is, can green bonds in Central Europe play a significant role to finance the transition to a sustainable economy? A. No, this remains a small niche segment in the region. B. Yes, there is significant potential in these instruments. Please submit our words now. And the result is B. It looks like the majority thinks that there is a huge potential in green bonds in Central Europe. Maybe our panel will also have some comments about these results. Let's see. The chair of this panel will be Jacek Kubas, Associate Director of EBRD. Jacek Kubas is an Associate Director in the London Office of the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, working in the EBRD's local currency and capital markets team. Jacek specializes in debt capital markets, big focus on covert bonds derivatives and sustainable finance, including legal and regula regulatory. The new venture and passion is innovation and financial technology. The discussants will be Flavia Mitsilotta, partner of Deloitte Luxembourg, Christian Zima, senior fund manager at Raiffeisen Capital Management, and Gregor Loik, chief financial officer of the Genai Group. Jacek, the floor is yours. Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you are fully rested after the lunch break and it was not a virtual lunch break, but uh, you had time to to uh, get the energy for, I think, a really exciting panel that we are about to start. And I'm so thankful to the panelists that found time to share their journey with sustainability and uh, for the results of our, of our poll that we have just concluded saying that there is a potential for green bonds and those instruments in Central Eastern Europe. But is it the market yet? Or maybe we're not yet having um, having the market there. But thank you very much for the National Bank of Hungary for hosting this really exciting event and in a really good time because exactly uh, this month, the global green bond market has just surpassed a trillion dollars in total issuance after a skyrocketing month of September in terms of uh, sales. If we compare the first nine months of 2020, even though we are living in such difficult times that are difficult for us personally, they are difficult for us economically, uh, the rise of um, the green bond markets compared to 2019 in the first nine months was by 12%. We saw such a debut issuers coming to the market, like for example, a trio of uh, car makers from Germany, including Volkswagen, Again, or one of the biggest U.S. bank uh, by assets, uh, J.P. Morgan Chase. Half of this year's sales in this market comes actually from Europe, Middle East, and Africa. So where is really uh, the Central Eastern Europe um, in this side? And why also EBRD is so much involved in the green and sustainability journey? I'm really grateful that I had a chance to moderate the panel with such fantastic experts because it's close to me personally and it's also close to my bank in terms of the business that we are doing. And when I think about a green bond market in, in Central Eastern Europe or in general, I always think about AAA. And it's not because the BRD is a AAA a rated issuer or bonds or because the, all the green bonds are AAA. But I think that this market is so special and AAA stands for me for three elements of the market. It's A for awareness, A for action, and the third A is for accountability. And that's something that we'll be discussing today with you. But 
for EBRD, we are not a new player in this market. Since 2010, we have been issuing green bonds and did actually 85 green bond issuances. As on the banking side, we really came to support Central Eastern Europe in terms of developing this asset class. Back in 2018, we have invested in a Mundi Planet uh, emerging green one fund that is focusing on the investing green bonds in Central Eastern Europe. But we also invested directly in a number of green bond issuances. For example, in Poland, in uh, green um, mortgage uh, cover bonds issued by one of the biggest Polish banks, uh, Pekal Bank uh, Kipoteczny. We are observing the development of those markets in our countries of operation. And only last week, we have just invested 50 million euro in the National Bank of Greece uh, green bond, which is the first uh, green bond in the Greek market and um, the first also by the financial institution. The proceeds of that uh, are, going, are going towards the wind energy and solar energy. So when we talk about this AAA, so bring it back uh, over and over. So awareness, action, accountability. Let's talk about accountability. May, some of you may know, but we have just made a commitment as an institution that by 2025, we're going to become a majority green bank. That means that over 50% of our business, which is in 38 emerging economies, including 11 EU countries in Central Eastern Europe, will be over 50% green and sustainable. It's a big commitment that requires a lot of work on our side as an institution, but also on the side of our clients and governments across Central Eastern Europe. Is there anything that can help us with? One of the elements that we are, of course, going to discuss at today's panel is how EU taxonomy as a regulation is helping uh, developing the green bond market. What about the EU Green Deal that says that by 2050, we're going to be carbon neutral economy? And are we going to be able to sustain that? And is capital markets an important element of that journey? And finally, let's think a little bit more about setting a scene for Central and, um, and Eastern Europe. Obviously, countries in, in these um, jurisdictions are seeing changes uh, in, um, in the climate, are seeing changes in the financial trends, and are trying to develop um, green capital markets. Hungary is really a very interesting leader in the region because the government has published a number of action plans in terms of climate and nature conservation and how financially to sustain that. If you look at our region, Poland was the first globally sovereign that in 2016 issued sovereign green bond, followed by additional two issuances out of uh, the country. We also see increase and in better ESG, so environment, social and governance disclosure from a number of companies, especially in some of the bigger Central Eastern European countries. And we see an interesting projects that we are actually also leading as a bank, not only on the investment side but advisory side so we're working with the hungarian authorities and national bank of hungary to create a green finance capital market strategy to create incentives for development of green uh, bond market and also to eliminate all the barriers we have similar projects in lithuania and we're also working on esg disclosure uh, in uh, in poland but without further ado i wanted to go two questions uh, to our panelists and let them also introduce themselves. So maybe as a great question, because we are not together in one room and we all see each other on the screen, I wanted to make it a bit more personal. So I'll ask you a first question, which will go to all of you, but let's start with Flavia. Flavia, if you could tell us a little bit your journey with sustainability, what sustainability really means to you uh, personally uh, in your daily life and also in your, uh, in your work. Thank you, Jacek. Can you hear me fine? Yeah, I can hear you well. Thank you. Excellent. I'm very sorry about the fact that you won't be able to see me because I have some troubles with my camera, but at least I'm, I'm comforted to know that you can hear me fine. So thank you very much for the question and very happy to be here with you today. I think that sustainability has really been uh, one of the most important aspects in my whole life, in fact, because I've decided back 18 years ago to devote my entire career to it. As a matter of fact, and I'll pick up on one of the key uh, uh, A of, of that, that you mentioned, and so I'll pick accountability. I was very interested in, in the role of accountability of companies that companies were taking uh, inevitably with the setup of the UN Global Compact that was really calling upon 
you know, the role of companies in terms of uh, stating their accountability and responsibility of and transparency in order to, um, you know, uh, move forward uh, on the more sustainability side of, of, of journeys. And that made me decide to uh, uh, really uh, start my whole career in terms of sustainability and work with companies to actually support them in the in this journey. And today, I, I think that uh, my my investment of some time ago proved, proved me right because sustainability and sustainable development have become really a uh, full, um, I mean, in, in incredibly important topics that companies and, and policymakers are looking at. And inevitably, I think that you know, going forward, uh, we'll be we'll be facing uh, many more changes that will uh, lead us to uh, a more sustainable economy and a more sustainable society. So, I'm very happy to have made that uh, that investment many many years ago, and I keep on living living it through, not only in my professional life but also in, in, through my personal engagement as I as I sit on on committees and advise. Uh, not only corporate, but also uh, public entities in, in terms of how they can incorporate ESG criteria into their policies, into into the way that they do businesses and the way they engage with society. Thank you. Thank you very much, Flavia. Let's move from Luxembourg straight to Vienna. Christian, why sustainability and, and what does really um, that do to you in your personal and uh, professional life? Uh, yes, good morning from, uh, good morning, good afternoon, sorry, I should say. Um, good afternoon from Vienna. Um, sustainability has really become a, a big issue in my professional life in, in recent years. Um, I can say that the majority of the investment funds I'm in charge of are now ESG funds. Uh, that changed uh, a lot in the last uh, five years. Two of these funds are green bond funds. One is an institutional one and the other one is, an, is a retail fund. And um, they work. Um, they have tremendous success. The uh, retail fund uh, has quintupled in in size in in the past five years. We started with less than 30 million, and now the fund is almost 150 million uh, big. And uh, we see daily inflows. So this is really, really um, very much uh, an, a focus of, of investors these days. And I'm also doing. Um, uh, the, greed, the, the, the global bonds um, in several uh, balanced funds. One of them is now the biggest retail fund in Austria. It's almost three, it has a size of almost three billion. So huge uh, success there and uh, money is flowing in uh, almost every day. So um, the topic is very high on the agenda of, of investors at the moment. And uh, Overall, our, our company is, is, is transforming many of our um, funds uh, into ESG ones. Many have already been, uh, others uh, are just uh, in, in, in just transformed at the moment, uh, as we are speaking, uh, uh, I can say. And um, sustainability is very, uh, very hot topic here at, at Raiffeisen. We were uh, the first, among the first to, to sign the, the UN PRIs, we uh, signed the Montreal Carbon Pledge uh, in 2015, and also our, our parent company, Raiffeisen Bank International, is also uh, highly ranked uh, uh, with, with regards to sustainability. So this is really an, an, a hot topic for us, and it's uh, getting uh, even hotter by the day. And personally, I think um, we have, um, as a society, a huge responsibility to, to protect the environment so that future generations can also lead a, a, a prosperous and, and enjoyable life as much as we do. So um, I'm, I'm really, really proud to be part of this. Thank you very much, Christian. And you mentioned very nicely, though, that about a hot topic, and that is uh, in, in two meanings, right, of temperature rising and, and also the importance and growing of that market. I don't know whether you're aware, but I'm Polish and in Polish, your surname means winter. So I hope, you know, with some good investments in green, <laughs> in green capital markets, we can we can cool off um, the climate. But before we go to nitty gritty details of the business, Gregor, I wanted to hear a bit of your story for the start too. Hi, from, you're in Slovenia, right? Uh, sustainability uh, came into my life a couple of years ago. Uh, when on a company level, we decided to change the division of the company. 
today our vision is uh, green transformation. So this green transformation uh, means that we want to be a promoter, an active player in energy green solutions uh, and to bring these solutions to client to help also the, our clients to go through this uh, green tra transition because I think it's uh, um, it's impossible that uh, when, we, when we talk about households that uh, they need somebody to help them to go through this transition. So we, we saw here the potential and on the other side uh, how we could complete our vision. So this is the this, this is how was we started. Thank you, thank you very much, Gregor. Flavia, I wanted to start and kick off this this panel um, with you. So we did the poll before, just right before our conversation, which actually resulted in saying that there is a big potential for Central Eastern Europe to actually develop a green bond market or become a green bond market. Uh, whether that is only because all of the sustainability experts are in the audience or that's the wider view, uh, we shall see uh, looking forward. But Hungary had a very good uh, 2020 in terms of um, green bonds. Um, the sovereign green bond that was issued by the state international markets and also the first corporate green bond done by CPI uh, Property Group, which is a real estate um, developers. Uh, but still the market in Hungary compared to some other compared to some other uh, C, compared to some other C countries is not really uh, well well developed. I was wondering, what do you think are obstacles um, for Hungary in Central Eastern Europe to progress development of green bond market? Is there any chance for Hungary to become a center for Central Eastern Europe on green and sustainability? And how do you see that in also bigger picture? Uh, I'll hand it over um, to you, Flavia. Thank you, Jacek. I think it's a very interesting question, but we have to take a step back and consider where we are starting from here. The European Union has had a very important role in pushing forward the climate agenda in the past, and this role has certainly fast forwarded in the past four years. The recent proposal of the European Commission to increase the climate target to at least 55% emission cuts from the current 40% has once more reiterated Europe's determination to strengthen climate action to the international community. But for as many issues in Europe, we cannot talk about a cohesive approach and have to accept the reality of things, being that Europe is made of many countries with their own peculiarities and identities. And the same applies when we look at issues such as climate change, of course. The plea for actions, uh, which from different sides of society has risen in the past years, has met generally with a positive responses, but in more concrete terms, politicians have, had, have committed to real change have not been many. Historically, I think can, countries in Central Eastern Europe have not taken a prominent stand regarding the many actions around climate. And there is also a recognition that these economies are somewhat less developed than the Western countries and more reliant on coal. Of course, there is a coal legacy that needs to be taken into account. Um, and therefore, it is not easy for them to take bold actions on the fight to climate change. But indeed, things have happened and things have changed. And as you mentioned, the steps taken by Poland and Hungary more recently are very good indicators that things will change going forward. And indeed, it's, it's nice to, to see that, you know, uh, if we consider perhaps um, Central Eastern Europe countries as somewhat late ad adopters, um, it is indeed, indeed um, interesting to see that um, for these kind of players, there will also be good opportunities um, to um, invest in um, innovative technologies um, and, co and more cost effective as well. Uh, particularly with regards, in, with regards to energy efficiency of buildings and renewable energy generation. The characteristics of residential building stock in many countries make it highly suitable for standardized energy solutions. And the high level of private ownership, however, presents challenges to widespread implementation of this solution. In seven out of the 11 uh, Central Eastern European countries, the building sector accounts for a bigger share of total energy use than the European average, reaching 50% in Hungary alone. Also, I think uh, when looking at the different solutions, specifically on renewables, it will be interesting to see how corporates uh, will respond 
and specifically how transnational companies are aiming to power their operations on renewables and the role that they can play effectively going forward in terms of fast forwarding um, you know, innovations in this sense. When looking about subsidies, for the energy efficiency, efficient re renovation of residential building, for instance, they have been available in the most part of the CE countries. And, but indeed, they have come mostly from, 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 from Europe in that respect. And so it is important to take into account that if a gap in new funding availabilities materializes, we need to have some financial instruments that can take the place, um, that can replace the, the subsidies and then can continue to fast forward um, growth and energy innovations. In that respect, I think that governments uh, can play a very valid role in terms of uh, ensuring that they can uh, provide uh, significant economic opportunities by consulting with business, supporting trainings, and, and develop initiatives that are able to uh, provide a more holistic approach when looking at the way that the, that the country is developing. And so in that respect, I think that a reliable regulatory environment is really uh, what countries need going forward. And I think that in that respect, the steps that uh, Hungary has taken in order, um, you know, with regards to the fact that um, they set climate neutrality goals for 2050 um, to support um, the European zero net emission strategy is indeed a very important step. And one that, that's, you know, as uh, well, builds in very nicely with the, with the green bond that has been issued. At the same time, I think that, you know, trust as, as, as with any um, issue in finance and, and even more so for sustainable finance is, um, is key. And, uh, but I think that indeed, you know, a first step has been made and for as much as policymakers will be able to continue corroborating their support um, for the infrastructure around um, sustainable finance, then uh, we will see uh, how things will evolve. But I'm, I'm very hopeful because I think this, this was an important step and now we need to give time to time and see how things will evolve. Thank you very much, Flavia. You mentioned trust, which I think you wanted to imply the issue of uh, greenwashing, which we will come to later. But I wanted to ask you, Christian. So Flavia said governments should set up uh, plans to create a bit of, you know, a subsidy or whatever word we're going to use, environment or ecosystem for development of, of um, green finance. But I wonder, is there any role for essential banks to play? Uh, there is a network for greening financial se sector where also the Hungarian National Bank is a part of it. So shall the central bank play a role or a key role in developing local green bond markets? And if so, what would be the role? Are they relevant from your perspective as an investor? Um, that's a great question. Um, I think um, it's, it's, they are very relevant. And well, there are different opinions out there. There are some voices that say central banks are responsible for monetary policy and they are not responsible to incentivize um, or subsidize climate um, friendly behavior by the various um, corporates or, or individuals. So uh, let's, uh, the, view, the view would be then that others should take over this responsibility like uh, parliaments, governments and so on, fiscal policy, for example. But on the other hand, um, just recent, I think two weeks ago, uh, ECB executive member Isabella Schnabel um, had a speech where she outlined um, some kind of framework she has in mind for, for the ECB dealing with, with such an issue. And um, first of all, she mentioned, or she stressed, I should rather say, that markets are uh, not pricing climate risks properly. So uh, there is an incentive, there is a, a necessity for, for central banks to correct for this failed uh, market pricing. And um, because what's the risk with this failed market pricing? So that the behavior is uh, by the um, uh, corporate sector or financial sector is then going in the wrong direction. And suddenly um, they have to change because climate risk is real. And then we have a, a huge economic disruption, a huge, huge deflationary shock and what, what would that mean? It would be even more difficult for the ECB to hit the inflation target. So they have to take this into, into their equation uh, in, in that view. Uh, also, they have to and they will uh, include uh, ESG risk in their stress tests um, because they are also regulating uh, the financial sector and they have to uh, take care of, of, of these risks when, when addressing 
uh, risks in the financial sector. And um, another possibility for them is to, to uh, um, support the development of green bonds is uh, via uh, adjusting the haircuts on the bonds they accept as collateral for, for, for the repo operations. Mm -hmm. So this could also uh, incentivize um, issuers to um, uh, issue more green bonds and investors to buy uh, in, into these green bonds. And um, um, and the, the last thing she also mentioned was that the ECB at the moment has a huge um, asset purchasing program running and a huge portfolio. And in these portfolios, they also want to reduce climate risks because it's 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 their responsibility. And I, I, I can really imagine that they will deliberately increase, for example, the share of green bonds just to, to support the transformation uh, of the economy to a, to a more greener one. So, um, and also to um, to support the the, 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 the pricing of, of green bonds so that it makes sense for, for issuers to issue green bonds instead of traditional bonds, for example. And um, for, with regard to Eastern Europe, uh, we have already heard from the deputy of the Hungarian Central Bank that they have uh, they are doing quite a lot, but I think others in, in other central banks in the region are, as far as I know, a little bit lagging. And um, the ECB uh, could be a role model, or the Hungarian Central Bank could be a role, role model for the for the whole for the whole region. So, uh, in the end, uh, sooner or later we will we will see um, uh, changes happening here. And I think the, the Central Bank has has really uh, um, a big influence, or could have a big influence there. Thank you very much, uh, Christian. I agree with you, especially you know the haircut thing may actually really um, really incentivize um, that market if then the proceeds are properly ring fenced to go for the green project. Gregor, I wanted to turn to you um, in terms of um, your experience. So you led the company for issuance of green bonds in uh, Central Eastern Europe, in Slovenia. It was not a benchmark issue, but it was still a significant signal to the market. I wanted to hear a bit more about your experience obstacles, benefits that you did in the end by for issuing them, the green bonds. And did you actually manage to target the pricing that would be different if that would not be green? And the investors, did you, did you manage to touch or bring to the pool investors that would otherwise not look into your bond issuance? The floor is yours, Gregor. Thank you for the question. Uh, yes, allow me first to maybe just a couple of facts on transaction. It was, yes, as you said, it was a small issue, 14 million bonds, seven year maturity, and it was issued in 2017. Uh, the proceeds were directed towards the installation of solar power projects uh, by our company, uh, which became in that year, the market player in Slovenia to offer households the self-sufficient supply uh, electricity, electricity using solar energy. Uh, at that time, that that bond was uh, the only bond, in, the first bond in Slovenia, I think also in the region. Uh, and for that, we have received also special recognition from international CBI uh, as pioneers in the implementation of innovative solutions for securing sources of financing for investments in renewables resources. Uh, but, uh, being pioneers uh, were also at that time the biggest obstacle. Uh, why? Uh, because uh, there was no market in Slovenia for green bonds at that time. Uh, there's no, nothing uh, at the moment also, but uh, no bond market at that time. Uh, no prospectus that we could uh, learn from. No investors uh, with green bond knowledge or at least uh, uh, um, some uh, green bond investors uh, that would want to invest in green bonds projects uh, and also no underwriters with no experience. Uh, so also everything we, that we have is was uh, green bond principle and the green project that needed the funding. Uh, so uh, yes, it was a, a hard thing to issue a green bond at that time. Uh, I could argue that, you know, from my perspective, Guinea uh, to have a brown bond or green bond, uh, at that time it uh, really didn't matter because as I said, uh, investors, uh, they were not looking for green at that time. And, uh, but nevertheless, at the end, we find investors uh, that has 
that have uh, sustainability responsibility already on agenda and we're keen to listen. Uh, we have shown them the good story behind the business plan and we present them the measurable effects on the environment. So we have promised or we, we, com we were we committed to uh, creating energy savings, reducing CO2 emissions and increasing production uh, with the proceeds of this bond. We, we were uh, so much uh, confident in uh, our business model that we promised that if these targets would not be delivered, we would increase uh, the coupon. Uh, so uh, that's how we started. Uh, and we also use these uh, green bond principles to, let's say, to work in our favor, because usually these principles are uh, more uh, a lot of work for us uh, costs, but we try to use them in our favor. Uh, and these principles, I mean, use of proceeds, management of proceeds, and of course, reporting and disclose, disclosing. Uh, with use of proceeds, what we did is, okay, we, we disclosed to our investors uh, everything into deep. So also we disclosed our potential clients uh the maximum exposure to them uh, we have we evaluate the credit risk so that's how you know they they uh, they persuade us okay you're not anymore a commodity trader you are a retail so with this we, we got additional uh, let's say a better rating uh, on on a bond uh, then a management of proceeds we promised uh, separate account with all the inflows and outflows so it will be audited by the Deloitte and everything will be transparent and the last uh, and i think also important for them was uh, reporting so we promised them a quarterly measurement uh, of uh, these goals uh, sustainability goals reducing emission increasing production green production uh, and that's how they all also get they got uh, measurable effects that they that they didn't have before so they could put in their annual reports uh, eventually the the numbers you know before they were just talking about how they are responsible to the environment but now they could put also uh, numbers in the annual report so all this i guess the the combination of everything uh, was a win-win situation uh, it was also a pr story uh, and at the end yes we benefited also from the pricing we got uh, 50 basis points lower pricing that we would got uh, otherwise. Uh, but as I said, this was also because of uh, of green bond that was treated as a uh, not a triple A from credit perspective, but much much higher. And uh, on the other side, uh, they they got also the 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 way that were, they were not just a passive observer, but they were active uh investor in sustainability thank you very much gregor when you say they refer to investors and i wanted just to follow up on this was that a majority uh foreign investors and inst institutional foreign investors how much is the ratio between the domestic investors in slovenia and internationals for this deal uh, this this is this is an this is an issue uh when i talk there you know it's a problem there's no market you know when, when you do a small issue i'm pretty sure that uh, christian would not be interested to to put money in uh, yes i understand there's no liquidity so what we need you know on, on the other side uh so it was a local issue we need to close it with the local investors but you know S slovenia is a small small country and but uh, so it's also shallow capital markets shallow you know the power from investors is shallow uh, so, you know, you can talk to uh, banks uh, and you can talk on the other side with pension funds, insurance funds, uh, etc. Uh, and at that time, you know, these uh, insurance uh, funds or, you know, they were not, they were not, they were not prepared to have uh, better pricing because uh, they were not seeing sustainability as their vision yet. Uh, so we found investors in uh, financial institutions, so local banks. This, this, I, I think they saw this opportunity as okay. I will give them a, a, a credit, or maybe I, it's, it's better to give them a, 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 a invest in a green bond. It should, should be something also for me in the green bond. Otherwise, it would just another credit. 
nobody would notice. Thank you very much, Gregor. I think that is a clear point, and we'll talk about investors' um, perspective later on. I wanted Flavia to, to come back to you and maybe elevate, at, elevate us a bit all towards the EU perspective. So you've been involved in a number of technical experts group in setting up EU taxonomy, which now is uh, adopted and will have to be implemented in uh, all member states, including in Central Eastern Europe. And I'm wondering whether a list of green businesses or economies where proceeds can be used and all the elements of taxonomy, including the green bond standards, which are slightly different to green bond principles that Gregor was talking about. How will that, do you think, help developing that market in Europe, but also in Central Eastern Europe? Uh, just uh, for a, for sake of clarity, I was involved in the tech that was looking at the division of a green bond standard, not in the one that was looking at the taxonomy. So, uh, so the one for the green bond standard, you know, there were there were separate task forces, and yes. so um, yeah, I think that today you have had different speakers that were uh, you had the Sean Kidney, for instance, who who was leading um, the the the, the tech that was also as looking at the taxonomy. But indeed, the Green Bond Standard was developed to be one of the tools that would help to uh, to use as much as possible uh, the taxonomy, because indeed this was done you know, as part of um, the European Commission willingness to develop trust in the market, as we were saying before, and to develop some sort of guidance uh, for investors to be able to uh, you know, diminish the potential for greenwashing, as we were saying, as we, as you, as you mentioned before, and that could uh, even, um, you know, uh, be very a very precise tool for for for, for investors choosing uh, what sustainability uh, categories to invest in. Because indeed, I think it's worth mentioning, as as you as you know, that uh, you know the the parameters and the standardization around climate finance, sustainable finance, and responsible and sustainable investing have been very much. Uh, low, uh, if non-existing at all in, in the past years. And this has indeed had its positives, but it also had, you know, some some ne negative elements uh, linked to it. And I think that it's, uh, as we were saying, it's important to build trust of investors in, in, in financial in financial world and specifically on uh, whatever is being developed on, on the side of sustainable finance. We need to ensure that there are standards and guidance that actually uh, allow investors to speak a common language and that's really what the taxonomy was aiming at doing so creating a common language around sustainability and sustainable investment that every um, investor could use and, and could speak the same language across the different countries and i think that this is indeed something that the, the tech aimed at doing because you know the, 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 the of course the push for the of the european commission in that respect was very strong and indeed, this is indeed one of the things that, that the market uh, was able to, to uh, profit from. And I think that, you know, the work of the technical expert group in this regard was really to develop a standard uh, which would um, indeed, uh, you know, uh, help investors uh, build their trust in the green bond market. And, um, and in, the, in that respect, uh, uh, you know, um, allowing investors to uh, have a view of projects that could be aligned with EU taxonomy through through the maturity, but as also allowing investors and providing them, I mean, allowing them to have a good view and transparent view uh, with regards to the information per, uh, you know, on the projects that they're going to finance. And I think that this is also something that's very important when we look at how we can increase the communication bet between issuers and investors and how can we make sure to actually uh, be sure that the issuers are really telling the the, 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 the right kind of tale to investors and that they can you know increase the credibility of the of their projects and in that respect I think you know that the that the um, the work done around the setup of a UGPS uh, really has the the right potential for it to become a global standard for green bond and that would put uh, you know the the EU in a leadership position in the sustainability agenda while creating a level playing field for European investors and I think that this has the potential to have significant traction, specifically in Central and Eastern Europe, particularly in view of the more nascent green bond market in that respect and the maybe lower level of maturity as well. 
Therefore, I believe that it's being able to rely on precise parameters and guidance, which are followed by all the industry, will be a more, su more successful in the region than in countries and among investors who are perhaps uh, um, who have a long track record on, G on, on green bond issuance in that respect. Thank you very much, Flavia. Let me turn this a little bit around and pick on you, Gregor. I'm sorry, but you're from a small capital market jurisdiction with a small green bond issuance. We have EU taxonomy, which is one size fits all solution, which will be much easier, you know, almost like, you know, going to the MAC drive of green activities and picking it up and ordering and going further. And I'm wondering whether that's something that would work for you like that or actually would create more complexity for you as an issuer in a small market. Thank you. Uh, yes, I support the idea for, you know, unite formalized taxonomy. Uh, it would be, you know, on the first hand, it's, it should be easier to, to negotiate, to structure and to invest because everybody is speaking the same language. Uh, but uh, what I'm afraid is, uh, yes, uh, the small issuers. So the small issuers, uh, you know, for them, maybe this would, the green label will not be achievable anymore because, uh, you know, when I issued a bond, pretty much, as I explained before, it was a homemade structure. Uh, and, you know, I, I didn't care at that time, it, was it green or it was not green? As I, I only just me that I know that is green. So it was one year later that uh, Gini asked Moody's for external assessment, and we got uh, excellent uh, uh, grade for greenability. But you know, when I read all these taxonomy green bond uh, standards, uh, that means that the small issuer now needs to be familiar even with more documents and more uh, obstacles. Uh, and, you know, if you are a bigger issuer, you can rely on underwriters. You know, you, you can ask them, please do this uh, instead of me. But for, you know, for small issuer, what can I do? I can, I can go to local underwriters. And the local underwriters, uh, they don't know anything in Slovenia about uh, green bond issuance. Uh, I don't know how it's uh, in other countries, but as you said, capital markets in Slovenia is uh, not developed. Uh, and maybe it's naive to, to think that the companies will issue green bonds if you if you can check the market and you see that there are only three, four uh, fixed income issues, uh, regular issues. So why then they would go from no, they are not familiar with regular bonds and they can go to green bonds. So I think that uh, what EU or central bank governments should do is maybe demystify a little bit capital markets and to, to give the chance also to small issuers that capital markets is also there for them. Uh, but I, at the moment, I don't see these opportunities. This is something that is uh, more for big guys and big issues. Uh, a benchmark issues because you have on one side you have investors because and you have the the underwriters that they would like to issue this kind of uh, bonds uh, without investors and without uh, underwriters it's hard to issue a green bond thank you very much indeed i think you know for the issuers of your size if you work on the smaller issue that will be much more burdensome to um yeah, to look at but on the other hand it gives investors a bit more comfort. And I think it's high time we, we talked to Christian uh, about investors. We asked the BRD are also a key investor in green bond markets in Central Eastern Europe. But I'm wondering, Chris, Christian, as a manager of green bond fund, do you really see the demand for green bonds coming out of uh, Central Eastern Europe uh, at the moment? You mentioned a bit in the intro that the market is hot. And I'm wondering also how hot the sea is and actually what interests uh, international investors in this market, especially if some of the sizes of the issuance may not be sub-benchmark or, ben or benchmark. Well, um, green bonds that have come to the markets in recent years have been um, heavily oversubscribed. Um, uh, to be honest, I'm not aware of any green bond issue that has not been oversubscribed. It's quite difficult sometimes for me to get a decent share of the of, of the new issue 
and uh, also Europe is, um, CE issues were heavily oversubscribed. So there is huge demand out there, there's huge appetite there, and the problem is still on the supply side. So hopefully uh, all the new initiatives that are taking place at the moment will increase the supply of green bonds because it will also make my life easier and also um, uh, easier for our investors that buy uh, our green bond funds. Uh, we have an open, our green bond funds are open-ended funds. So um, that's, that's the issue that uh, Greg had uh, already uh, highlighted that liquidity is of course uh, very essential for me as a, as a fund manager because our clients um, have the opportunity or the possibility to buy and sell uh, shares of the fund any day they like. So I would, it, it's very necessary for me to be able to buy or sell the bond on the market. And it's at the moment, uh, as there's so much demand and so uh, it's, the supply is rising, but it could be, could be bigger in my view. Um, uh, it's, it's easy to sell a green bond on the market because there's so much demand. But if you're on the buying side, it's sometimes really difficult on the secondary market. So um, what I would like to highlight is that issue size is very essential for me as an investor. So uh, I know that's for a, for a small uh, issuer uh, like Gregor, it's, it's difficult. But um, for an investor like me with a fund, um, uh, it has to be at least 300 million or even benchmark size of 500 million. That, that, that's, that's fine for me. Um, and with, with Central and Eastern European issues, uh, it's difficult. Well, there have been some, some issues by corporates, but not very many. Uh, on the other hand, they were um, um, pioneers on the sovereign uh, front. So Poland was the first sovereign to issue a, a, a green bond and Hungary uh, followed this year. And I would think that other uh, countries in the region will also sooner or later issue green, bond, green bonds. So um, I think there's a potential in, 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 in CE. Um, on the corporate side, probably it's, it's a structural issue. Um, uh, Western corporates, corporate markets are um, highly developed and in the East, it's probably not so easy. So um, um, I think there's, 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 there's demand outside as demand, the demand is there, uh, particularly in an environment where um, yields globally are quite low. So um, to take some country or spread risks in Eastern Europe, um, I think investors are ready to do that, um, but the supply should come. Hopefully it will. Absolutely. I think we see more and more issuances uh, as well as, uh, as a bank um, and investor in Central Eastern Europe, we see them among the banks, but as you mentioned, we see energy companies and we also uh, see real estate companies and obviously mm -hmm. some sovereign, some of the other companies, some of the other countries like Lithuania, they also joined um, that, let's say, part. But I'm wondering then if you as a green bond investor, what's more important for you now to look at? And it's a bit of a tough question. Is yeah. it the green impact that actually you're you really care about and, and that's how you evaluate your investments looking at them or is it a yield which you know how much actually money you're going to make or you're going to answer to me in a very safe way that has a combination of both christian floor is your um well to be honest it's it's really it's, it's tough to say i think it's a combination of both um of course investors want a financial return they want the performance they want um it's, it, has, it hasn't changed, I think, versus the past. On the other hand, with the green bond, um, investors can, for the very first time, really have an idea where their money is flowing to, where they are invested. Um, with a traditional bond, you have no idea, is this money used for building a new factory? Is this money used for paying the wages of the employees? Or is it just uh, for sh taking to buy back your shares? So, but with a green bond, you know that you're doing something good as an investor. And so um, our clients are uh, also keen on, on knowing what impact uh, their investments have. And in, with green bond, it's more or less the avoidance or the reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. So this is, this is of course, an, uh, an, a big issue. I'm not sure what investors really prioritize. Is it um, impact or is it yield? In the current environment of, of, of really very, very low yields, 
I, I would uh, think that uh, um, avoidance and of, of greenhouse gas emissions or impact is probably even more important to them. But what's also important is, of course, credibility and transparency. Uh, credibility means that we do not want to have greenwashing. We do not want to finance greenwashing. So credibility is, 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 is very essential and transparency, of course. So we, uh, we want uh, orderly reports. We want the reporting that really uh, shows us afterwards that all the promises they made, uh, the, the, the issues made that they really uh, stick, stick to them. So th this is also important and I think also important for our clients. Thank you very much, uh, Christian. I think we take the credibility and transparency as a really important points of, of this market uh, from the investor perspective and also from issuers. Flavia, I wanted to put you in a bit of a hot chair of green market. Hopefully you are ready for that and ask you a bit of a devil's advocate question. So there was recently a study done by uh, Bank of International Settlement that touched upon the questions that Christian mentioned, credibility and transparency, and raised the question about the purpose of green bonds. Not really talking about greenwashing, but saying, really, do green bond issuance or does green bond issuance lead to decarbonization? The study was saying that not really. And I wanted to pick up your view on this and talk a little bit about that element of the market, which is so important, especially for impact investors. Thank you, Jacek. Yes, I'm familiar with the study. <laughs> I'll do my best to give you my perspective. So I believe that the, the study was rather skeptical of labels rather than green bonds per se, although they did highlight some of the limitations around green bonds that you just mentioned. But in this respect, I think we can argue that labels have been so far a very good proxy for quality the industry has accepted and embraced for lack of better metrics. This has led the market to grow, but mostly it has allowed almost any kind of player to innovate and develop new products and instruments that make sense for them. The same has happened in the SRI industry, as I was mentioning before. So anything to do with sustainable and responsible investing, at least for the fund um, uh, market, you know, we have seen growing quite exponentially. I believe two years ago, we reached peaks of 11 trillion of assets under management in Europe alone. So indeed, I think that, you know, these are very high numbers that show that there is an appetite, but also that demonstrate that the lack of clear standards allows for players to be a little bit, you know, um, innovative and creative and do, you know, freestyle development in terms of what they think are sustainable uh, financial products. In that respect, I think that, you know, the European Commission needed, about, it was a very opportune time for the European Commission to come in and actually put some clear standards in that respect to ensure that the growth that will continue spurring actually um, will, will fulfill some specific uh, standards. Um, but I think that, you know, these, these high numbers, um, you know, uh, actually allow us to recognize the importance uh, of, the, of the industry to allow, to, to, to grow and innovate. But the same holds true with for, for green bonds, of course. You know, the growth has been incredible in a very short time span. Um, and indeed, it has to be acknowledged that, you know, some standards need, need to be put in place. What I disagree with the study is that they claim that it is easy for investors to analyze companies' performance at entity level and determine the environmental soundness of the issuers. I think that it's fair to say that company data is today still very hardly, um, uh, very, very hard to compare across players and industry, not only for investors, but for all users as well. Hence the importance of the discussions today around the development of a platform for ESG data supported and driven by the European Commission in order to facilitate data flow and comparison. Maybe another point where I disagree with the study is that the claim that the current green bond labels does not necessarily guarantee material reduction in carbon emission. Though in fact I see where such a statement, statement is coming from, I would like to challenge the underlying of this notion which, which takes into account a negative perspective of issues of green bonds in general. First of all, I think we need to be as inclusive as possible if we want to make the climate transition a reality. Therefore, only allowing selected players will not be enough. Secondly, the exercise of issuing green bonds will allow issuers themselves investing in green bonds is possible and financially relevant. And therefore, following business logics, they should be inclined to focus more on these activities, even if in the, if in the past they have done much less so. But I think they also are generally in favor 
as the survey recognizing uh, recognizes the, the advantages of a pro, uh, project-based approach. It enables a wide range of firms to issue green bonds and incentivizes them to initiate green projects. I think this gives a, a forward-looking approach as projects can cover investments in technologies that promise environmental benefits in the future. And the rapid development of the green bond market shows that the project-based approach has met the demand from investors and issuers. Further, it has raised awareness of sustainable growth amongst all market players and demonstrated that investors' appetite for climate-related financial instruments is there and growing. The more we can do to push forward in this direction and make green, bond, green bonds accessible without compromising the quality, of course, the, the better it will be. What the standards, what the standard, the European standard has tried to do in, is also taking issuers by the hand, really, in terms of how to streamline and simplify as much as possible to like tools like the framework and also raising the bars on, on the ver verification side, which will indeed help creating, um, again, higher quality of these products and create a level playing field. So, in essence, I see a win-win for everyone. Thank you very much, Flavia. We have five minutes left towards the end of the panel and before I sum it up. So, I thought let's have uh, last closing questions to each of us. Uh, and I will start with um, you, Gregor. So what do you th what would you give a practical advice to Central Eastern European issuers looking to issue green bonds? You know, you have a minute to give a short practical advice. You should stick to your sustainability business model because only the model that lasts will attract investors in the long term. Uh, but if you know if you cannot do a green bond, you still have alternatives with a green green loan or what whatever kind of funding. I think the most important is that you stick on the other side with the business model. The funding is just you know the cherry on the, on the cake, so you can package everything and you said you know I was taking care of sustainability from the start until the end. Uh, but uh, the most important thing is stay on the ESG path. Uh, and that's it. Thank you very much. Christian, over to you. Um, well, for me as an investor, I already mentioned this um, issue size is important. Um, a second party opinion is, is, is uh, essential in my view. So you have some external rating, some kind of rating agency that confirms that uh, you are um, um, sticking to green bond principles, for example, um, I, th I think this will help. And um, yeah, just try to to improve your um, so, so sustainable um, procedures in your in your organization. I think that's that's also helpful. Thank you very much, Christian. Flavia. I think I would like to echo um, the comment made by uh, Gregor in that respect. I think that you know it's very important to stick to uh, one sustainability business model and make make the, the green bond being as much as re as relevant as possible. Of course, I mean the, the projects have to be as relevant as possible for for the business that the company is trying to invest in. You know, um, I think it makes sense and and it's the only way that it will be uh, a credible instrument and that will will uh, spur investors trust in that respect. Thank you very much uh, to my distinguished panelists for that. If I shortly sum up of, of the panel, I feel like the number one thing that, uh, that we talk about is really important is credibility and transparency. And that comes really with the reporting side, that comes of avoiding greenwashing, that comes with implementing EU taxonomy as difficult as it may be. I think second conclusion, which is really important for us, is that we still need, especially for CE market, the incentives to, to create uh, create that market where these are done for the government or through a central bank, through a haircut in monetary policy operation. That's one of the important elements. And the third thing that really comes to my mind, uh, listening to all of us, is the size. The size of this market matters for international investors. So if we want to attract international investors, we have to follow international practice and look at sub benchmark, which is 250 million or 500 million euro uh, benchmark issuance. If you're looking at purely domestic investor base, that's a different story. But uh, those three points uh, came to my mind uh, looking at our discussion. I'll close it with my favorite AAA. So let's think about awareness, action, and our accountability.
for how we do the environment and how actually we are investing and issuing in and structuring green bonds. Thank you very much to Flavia, uh, uh, Christian and Gregor for a fantastic panel. No one can uh, clap, but I will do that for you guys. Thank you very <laughs> much and have a great afternoon. And hopefully I'll see you soon. And uh, hopefully our audience also enjoyed the panel and found it useful in terms of development of green bond markets. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jacek, and to all the panel participants. Ladies and gentlemen, as the event is coming to an end, let me thank you for your kind attention. We do hope the conference offered much, for, much food for thought and inspiration. We do hope to meet you again in the future in a personal format at one of our events.
Thank you.